Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the City Council February 25th City Council meeting. Um, could I ask everyone to silence their cell phones, please? Thank you very much. This meeting is being recorded by video and audio in accordance with the open meeting law. And I'm gonna ask for a flag salute, so Councilor Holmgren, can you um, lead us in the flag salute, please? Thank you. Madam Clerk, can we have the first order of business, please? First order of business is oral communications. So under oral communications, the public has the right, the opportunity at every regular scheduled meeting to be heard under oral communications on matters not appearing on the agenda. Oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to city business to appear before the city council, state their problems without debate, and the matter shall be referred to the proper agency through the office of the mayor. The resident will be notified within two weeks prior to relative of the, the disposition of same, and a copy shall be forwarded to the city council. Persons speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes each. The council president shall not allow complaints to individual performances. So is there anybody here that would like to speak under oral communications this evening? Step right up. Name and address, please. Hello, my name is Patty Amaral. I live at uh, Myrtle Square. I would like to talk about traffic in our city. We all have experience sitting in it, driving in it, and we dislike it. Our city is a tourist town now, but our visitors don't come just in the summer. Now they are arriving sooner and sooner, making driving in our small town much more difficult and unsafe. Today I took an hour from my day, from 2.30 to 3.30, and I stood at the corner of Easton Ave and Webster Street and counted cars. I counted 709 cars on Easton Ave, 84 of those cars turned onto Webster Street, and 135 cars coming from Webster Street. I witnessed many near accidents as well as cars parked illegally. What can be done in this area and throughout our city? We could have a police officer stationed at one of those areas and their presence could help. We could also purchase safety dummies to put on crosswalks in this area and throughout our city. I also stood at Market Basket and witnessed too many stop sign violations and near accidents as well. Perhaps some safety dummies there as well, as when the 200 apartments go up, they will need them too. Um, we have a petition here with over a thousand signatures and counting and I would also like to say can you please revise the PDF showing the paternity club in the school project zone before you send it to the state. Thank you very much. Thank you Patty. Uh, Madam Clerk can we have the next order of business please. Next order of business is the presentation from Bob Gillis, Ruth Pino, and Bruce Toby, co-chairs of the Gloucester 400th Anniversary Steering Committee, regarding the announcement of the winner of the Gloucester's 400th Anniversary Commemorative Medal Design Competition. Welcome, Mayor Toby. How are you? I'm well, Mr. President. My best to all of you, and my thanks on behalf of the Gloucester 400 team, which grows by the day um, for your allowing us to join you this evening. Uh, we appreciate you hosting this event. Um, I like to say back in the day that this auditorium, this room is the community's living room. Um, and it's in that spirit that we're here this evening. And I'm gonna talk through the chair, but I'm gonna look at the audience too, because this is a community event we're having tonight. Anytime you wanna get information on the 400th as it evolves, we're three years plus away, um, the first thing I want to do is highlight our website, which is growing by the day uh, because things are happening and traction is being gained. For the record, that's www.gloucesterma400.org. I think there will be pictures of tonight and the happy selection about to occur that will be up there pretty quickly. 
I'd like to give a little bit of context on the medal competition. Then Tri Chia Bob uh, Gillis is going to get up and give some thank yous to folks who've been instrumental in getting the medal competition to this point. And then Tri Chia Ruth Pino uh, has the distinctive honor of opening the envelope and reading the name that none of us knows yet of the winner of this competition. Those slides that are just going to rotate while the three of us talk represent the images of the 300th anniversary, the 350th, and the 375th. And in 50 years, the medal pick tonight will be on whatever the functional equivalent of PowerPoint is when another winner is announced having been chosen. We're building a foundation for the 400th. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be a celebration for us, by us, of us, that others are welcome to come watch. And it's going to celebrate and commemorate Gloucester, its heritage, its legacy. And first and foremost, as we focus on a lot of components of that legacy, our people. If you've seen our logo, what is our tagline? Our people, our stories. And we'll have some exciting news and progress to announce very soon on that front, too, as that effort launches quickly. But other attributes besides our people. High on the list, the arts. Painting, literature, sculpture. Uh, if you go back to the 375th, a special part of that one was, in fact, sculpture. And this room has hosted, in recent years, some memorable events. The fishermen's wives coming here, and the mayor will remember that well, with the announcement of the selection of the design for the statue that now graces the boulevard, the Fisherman's Wise Memorials. Al Duca of Anasquam coming here with the Marquette that again became reality, the Fitzhugh Lane Memorial down on Harbor Loop. And perhaps at a special crowning 375th event uh, was when this room looked like the Isabel Stewart Gardner and it hosted a nationally recognized figurative sculpture show. But the medal is just as much a part of that as anything. The selection of the 375th, uh, as mayor, I got to participate with co-chairs John Bell, later mayor, and Gap Lafada, longtime counselor, uh, sitting down with Walker Hancock to offer him the medal. No, I'm not at that point in my career. He was 98 at that point. But I have a protege who will work under my tutelage and that'll be the bronze that comes up, the silver that comes up next by Daniel Altshaw. This time we took a different tack, a very different tack. And we went literally international in promoting this competition. And the responses that we got, the designs that were shared with us, were international and national. 50 competitors. And who came out of a blind selection to be our three finalists, young women with roots in Gloucester. What does that say about Gloucester? Huh? I want you three and your families, and I don't believe Shannon's here this evening, but two out of three ain't bad, and you be proud. You carry this the rest of your lives. The winner's medal will be cast, but there will be only three winners tonight because the other two will be cast before we're done, too. So there's a lot to come out of this, and we're very proud of the way this event has gone and the participation it's evoked. So that's the context. That being said, I'm going to sit down. Bob Gillis is going to come up and do some thank yous. Thank you all for having us tonight. And I'm going to try to keep this short. My, my main job is to really to say thank you tonight um, to several people. But um, first of all, for this contest, we had cr different criteria. I'm not going to list them all. There were several, um, but one of them was that the, the theme slash concept successfully honors something that is uniquely Gloucester. And then the other things, it has to have the, the lettering Gloucester in 400 in it, and it also has to have the dates 1623 to 2023. We were very fortunate that we had five local renowned artists that selected the three finalists.
who are here tonight, or at least two of them are. And I'm going to give you those names, and if you could stand up when I give you the names, I'd appreciate it. The first one, my friend Joy Dye Buell, dedicated artist and educator. Where are you, Joy? I know you're here. <laughs> Joy maintains a studio uh, in Gloucester and uh, teaches at the De Cordova Museum, where her, her insightful instruction has been sought after for 15 plus years. Um, Janice Carragher Charles, is Jan here tonight? Okay, um, Mr. Leon Dowsett, was he able to make it? Mr. Ken Ruby, I know that the, the chair of the committee, Mr. Roger Armstrong, is here. So, Roger, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Roger is a longtime civic leader and champion of the arts in Gloucester. Mr. Armstrong is also an owner of the State of the Art Gallery on Rocky Neck. Serving alongside him are the four people that I just mentioned to you. So we were very, very fortunate to have these um, distinguished artists narrow the field down to three. And that happened back in October. From there, what we did was we enlisted the assistance of Rebecca Reynolds, who happens to be the um, executive director of the Manship Studio in Gloucester. I'd like to have Rebecca stand up because um, she has been instrumental in this, this whole thing. Re Rebecca taught us the meaning of the name, of the term numismatist. Anybody heard of that before? But we learned that term. The other thing that we learned from Rebecca was that these aren't coins. These are metals. Remember that, OK? But that's, there was, that, that was only the tip of the iceberg. We couldn't have gotten this far without Rebecca Reynolds, truthfully. And she helped us to enlist two nationally known numismatists, one who came up from Brooklyn, the other one from Rhode Island, who came up to judge the three medals. We locked them in a room, and they were there for 40 to 45 minutes. We asked them to put the name of the winner in an envelope, seal the envelope, and Ruth Pino is holding that envelope right now. Um, so she'll be revealing that in a minute. But I also want to take the time to, to thank uh, Tom Lance, who has also been so helpful in this whole process, hosting meetings at the Br Brass Monkey. Please stand, Tom. <clears throat> and he has helped us immensely along the way, too. Um, and also, I want to um, give a heads up to uh, Christine Armstrong, who has been there side by side with us right along. You're still here, aren't you, Christine? There you are. It's been very helpful. Finally, if I could just ask uh, members of the 400th Steering Committee to stand, I would appreciate it. You know who you are. I see two of you right there. Please stand. <laughs> the steering committee has been working very hard for, it's been two years now. We've been working for, for two years on this and, and uh, doing a great job. Finally, I would ask that the members of the board that oversees our steering committee, um, which is the Gloucester Celebration Corporation, those board members, please stand if you would. We've had, in addition to these folks, we've had a tremendous number of volunteers, and we're really excited about uh, what's coming down the pike here, and it all belongs to you, so we, we, uh, we're, we're very excited about it. I'll ask Ruth Pino to come up. First, it took me a whole year to learn how to say numismatist. Good evening and thank you for all being here tonight. Everyone in this room is here to celebrate Gloucester in many different ways. Bob Bruce and I, along with Rebecca Reynolds and Tom Lance, have been working for 18 months to get to this point, to have a commemorative medal, and we are happy to share it with you in City Hall Auditorium and those of you watching at home. Thank you to Bruce for this idea to, and Steve LeBlanc for making this happen tonight. 
There are lots of passionate people in the room tonight, and that passion centers on one thing, and that's Gloucester. Join us and the many volunteers as we march our way onto celebrating 400 years since the Dorchester Company landed on our shores. Before we open the envelope, which I'm really nervous about doing a Steve Harvey, um, I'm going to read a little uh, background information about the three finalists. One of the finalists couldn't be here tonight, um, which was really a shame, but she had a long planned trip to Florida with her family, and they left yesterday. So the first is Alexis Ciparini, who is here. Whether making art or playing with her dog, Frank, the ocean holds a special place in Ciparini's heart and mind. The artist grew up in Gloucester and although now living in Boston, considers the city her home. She has been eager to introduce her art to the community and give back in some way to the place where her family and roots remain. When the opportunity arose to create a design for the metal, it simply felt right. And in creating her design for Gloucester 400, the artist also found a way to strengthen her moorings in her hometown. Uh, Beth Swan, who's not here tonight, I still want to read a little biography about her. The artist lives with her family in Gloucester, where they count their blessings that they reside year-round in a place where there's such a rich, working, waterfront history, a lively community of artisans, and extraordinary scenic beauty. Quoted from her, one of our favorite activities is to go to Stagefoot Park to play in the playground, walk along the boulevard among the flowers, watch the cut bridge go up and down, and end up on Main Street for treats. Beth's design began as an illustration inspired by life in Gloucester long before she knew about the design competition. The possibility that out at sea could represent Gloucester 400 for generations to come has left her happily surprised and deeply honored. And the third finalist is Shannon Wilkins. Where are you, Shannon? In Shannon's own words, Gloucester means family. It's a home by the sea with a proud heritage. My father was raised on the Portuguese Hill neighborhood of Gloucester, and his mother was a strong, self-sufficient, hard-working woman who took her five children to the Lady Gavoyage Church every Sunday and knew the struggles of, having, of being a fisherman's wife. My family story is similar to many who lived, loved, left, and left and came back, raised families, and continued to love this place they call home. Now living in Maine, Wilkins' design goal was to help connect people with the families, places, and history that built Gloucester over the past 400 years and will sustain it through the next 400. So, I'm so nervous. Um, good luck, everyone. And the winner is Beth Swan. So in the event that Beth would win, she asked if I would read a statement from her and so that, I'm going to do that now. Dear members of the community of Gloucester, the Gloucester 400 committee members and volunteers and contest judges, I am so pleased to have been able to participate in this competition to create the commemorative medal for our city's 400th anniversary. Living in Gloucester is a special privilege and I am elated that a miniature tactile piece of art will be fashioned of my design depicting some small facets of our multifaceted and vibrant home. I like to think of the medals being crafted, enjoyed, held, gifted, peered at closely, and passed on for generations. It is an honor to my friendly competitors, Lexi and Shannon.
I admire all of your work and wish that all three designs are celebrated as your designs show other unique facets of Gloucester and help us further commemorate all the city has to offer. I very much look forward to holding the finished piece, handing it to my little boys to inspect, and sharing it with families and friends. I hope the design will be successful and help contribute to a grand 400 celebration. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for all of you who have gathered here working hard to make Gloucester such a wonderful place. So there you have it. Mr. President, if, if, if a former city councilor could make a motion tonight, it would be that you take a recess and you congratulate Shannon and Lexi, who will be cast. You will be cast. I would have made that motion. Thank you again. Uh, I'd, I'd like to entertain a motion to uh, have a 10 minute recess. So, thank you, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We are in recess for 10 minutes. I'd like to thank everyone coming out this evening. Um, those of you who are going to stay, could you please take your seats? We're going to resume our city council meeting. All right. So we are back in the uh, city council session. That was a great presentation from the Gloucester 400. Um, thank you, everybody that was here for the um, that sponsored it and put this forward for everybody to be here this evening. Madam Clerk, can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business is the consent agenda. Are there any counselors that would like to pull anything off the consent agenda this evening? Seeing none, entertain a motion to accept the consent, the consent agenda. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The consent agenda has been accepted. Madam Clerk, next order of business, please. Next order of business is the Budget and Finance Standing Committee report of February 20th. Councilor Cox. Good evening. Um, I have two consent agendas before us tonight. Um, one consent agenda A consists of eight grants that we are accepting. Consent agenda B are three essays that require a roll call vote. Um, in regards to consent agenda A, does anybody have anything they would like to pull from the agenda? Seeing none, I will make the motion. Second. I, I gotta make the motion first. I was right there. <laughs> I move that budget and finance, or that the city council accept the budget and finance consent agenda A consisting of eight grants. I'll still second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Councilor Cox. Consent agenda B. Does anybody have anything they would like to remove from the agenda? Seeing none, I move that the city council accept the budget and finance unanimous consent agenda B uh, consisting of three essays. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Yeah. Oh. Nope. Roll call. Roll call. Oh, roll call. My, so, my, I'm sorry. Um, Madam Clerk, we have the roll call. Councilor Nolan? Yes. Councilor O'Hara? Yes. Councilor Pat? Yes. Councilor Cox? Yes. Councilor Gilman? Yes. Councilor Hogram? Yes. Councilor Blank? Yes. Councilor McCarthy? Yes. And Councilor Memhard? Yes. The BNF unanimous consent agenda B for essays 21 through 23 passes on a vote of nine in favor, zero opposed. How can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business is the, oh, sorry. The ordinance and administration February 17th, um, there was no meeting, and now there's the planning development February 5th um, standing committee report. Councilor Gilman.
Council, before we get started, I would just like to disclose that under MGL Chapter 268A, Section 23B3, um, that I'm a volunteer with the Gloucester Education Foundation Community Council, and I have no financial interest or conflict on the matter before the committee. Thank you. Councillor Pat. Yes, uh, under Mass General Law Chapter 268A, uh, I'd like to declare that uh, when the original fundraising for Light Up Meadows Field was done, it was done through the Gloucester Fund, and I am the fund's president. Thousands of dollars was raised for which we, uh, I oh, and the fund had no financial interest. It was only assisting the group in raising funds, which were turned over to the Gloucester Fishermen's Athletic Association. And again, I have no financial interest or conflict and can discuss and vote on um, the requested um, matters before us this evening. Thank you, Councillor Pat. Councillor Gilman. Councillor, through the chair, I'd like to ask if Attorney Payson can come up because there are a few questions that have come up over the last couple of days that we'd like him to answer for us. Thank you. Absolutely. Chip. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the City Council. Uh, there are some members of the administration uh, who will follow me who'd like to respond uh, to some of the questions that were raised last night. Uh, we hope we'll, you'll find them informative. But before um, they do, I wanted to provide some clarity regarding uh, a possible deed restriction for the East Gloucester School site. Um, as you're aware, the Article 97 petition proposed removing any possible Article 97 restriction from Mados Field and instead placing an Article 97 restriction on the East Gloucester site. This is a proposal we're making to the state. If they accept our proposal and vote to approve the petition, we, the city, are responsible for placing the deed restriction on the East Gloucester site. We draft the restriction, we execute it, and we record it. So if the Article 97 vote passes the legislature, the city will not place a deed restriction on the East Gloucester school site until well after the debt exclusion vote in November. Now I'd like to turn it over to John Dunn. Uh, he's got another matter that he'd like to discuss. Thank you, Chip. John. Good evening, Councillors. Um, during last night's <clears throat> testimony, there were some questions about the timing uh, and the timeline of the Article 97 issue. Um, and I thought it might be helpful to kind of review both what's happened in the past as well as um, why we're, we're trying to move forward on this at this point in time. <clears throat> so in 2014, the East Gloucester Elementary School was identified as the most in need of a new facility after the West Parish School, which was already in the works. Um, in February of 2017, East Gloucester was selected by the MSBA for a school building project. Uh, in September of 2017, the East Gloucester School Building Committee was formed and has met approximately 40 times since then. I, I didn't count them all up, but it seems to me like maybe it's 140, but. Um, <clears throat> in December 2017, the, city, the then City Council approved a feasibility study appropriation in the amount of a million dollars. In May of 2018, and OPM was selected owner's project manager. That is as required by MSBA rules. Um, that then owner's project manager was on board with the school building committee, and they then made, <coughs> we made a decision on a designer, and that was in November of 2018. Um, once the designer was on board, we kind of went across the area to identify potential sites for the new school. Five potential sites were identified at that point. Um, three were identified as the most likely to be developed for the new school. Those were the East Gloucester site, the Veterans Memorial site, and a portion of the city-owned property off of <clears throat> Green Street. At that point, the city's legal office began title work on all three sites. In September of 2019, nine potential options over the three sites were reviewed and reduced to two. And then in October 2019, the veteran site was, um, <clears throat> was approved for the new consolidated school. It was chosen by the school building committee and subsequently approved by the MSBA. 
So that kind of is the kind of the overall timeline that has gotten us to to this point. In the summer of 2019, it was decided by the school building committee to target the summer or early fall of this current year 2020 for the submittal of schematic design plans for approval by MSBA and to schedule a citywide vote for funding of the project. The MSBA schedule provided for an appearance at its August 2020 meeting. After consultation with the city clerk's office, the only reasonable option for the override vote was to be in November of 2020. In October 2019, General Counsel Chip Payson briefed the building committee on the status of the title work on the, on the veteran site because this was a site that was chosen. He recommended Article 97 legislation at the state level to remove any small but potential issues regarding the school committee gaining clean care and custody of the entire site as required by the MSBA. The Article 97 action requires approval by two, a two-thirds vote of both the State Senate and House. As the current legislative session ends on July 31, 2020, we need to move this along in order to show the MSBA that the school committee has control of the site. The legislator will not come back into session until 2021, so if you want to garner MSBA approval, we must petition for Article 97 action in the next little while. So that's why we are here before you for this. We do have a relatively small window of time. Now, the other thing that we recognize, um, and that is, is part of the overall project. As with any school building project, there is a natural cycle for when major construction renovations projects should start, and that is at the end of the school year in June. As well, a new renovated building should be occupied at the beginning of the new school year in September. So we're kind of looking at a year between taking action and actually moving forward on a potential project. If we don't adhere to the schedule proposed, we risk losing a year in the process. Um, and at this point, construction inflation is running at an annual rate of 4% to 8% a year. It has been recently at the top end of the scale for a variety of reasons, but 4 to 8% a year, 4% is basically somewhat historical. So construction inflation almost always out, outpaces um, regular you know, consumer inflation in the economy. Um, at 4 to 8% and based on a $52 million um, construction cost in the project, we are looking at a year's delay costing anywhere from two to four million dollars in extra costs. So that is one of the reasons that the school building committee is really focused on this, the administration is focused on this, and we would like to move this forward as quickly as possible. Answer any questions anybody may have. Be happy to come back up if you have questions later. Any questions? Thank, Thank you, John. Mr. Catamatori. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things um, related to graphics, maps, and plans. Um, there were a couple that were introduced last evening um, during the public hearing, and I were, wasn't exactly sure what was being presented to you. You may have received things via email, or some of the speakers actually had some uh, some either maps, graphics, or plans in their hands. Um, there was one reference um, to a graphic that was in a presentation that was made to the school building committee about two weeks ago from a traffic engineer from Niche Engineering that's working with um, Dora and Whittier as part of the design team of the combined school project. And the purpose of that graphic was to present data related to collecting uh, traffic in the current condition and also what might happen in the future if there were a combined facility um, at the veteran site. And so traffic engineer, not, not uh, land surveyor, put a yellow area over um, the entirety of 
the current school as well as um, the Meadows Field and some parcels um, to the north. It was purely just to identify the area that in his eyes he is focused on um, as, as basically the center of uh, the evaluation of traffic. So there was no intention to include anything other than um, the veterans uh, site as well as Meadows in, in that graphic. Um, there is no intention by the administration to do anything other than the petition that's before you to expand the footprint uh, allowed for this combined school to include um, the Mado site. Um, and if that's something that anyone wants in, in writing, the administration has said they're happy to put that in writing that, again, the, the, there's more than adequate room um, for uh, the proposal. And if you l also looked through that presentation later on, the site plan uh, was included, which, again, only encompasses those two parcels. Um, I've also seen uh, a submission of um, a plan, and it actually is a plan, although it's an old one, um, relating to um, the, the Parsons Playground as well as the East Gloucester School site. And um, I can tell you that uh, in the packet that was presented to you from, from Chip Payson with this petition, um, that no net loss that you heard a lot about last night, um, which is a state policy, um, the initial analysis was looking at essentially almost all of the green space on, on the Mado site as well as some portion of that uh, extends onto the school site. There's actually a line that divides right field um, that's, that's actually on part of the school property. So that initial analysis was just to show that um, at the end of the day, there, is, there was approximately, and it was a little bit less than three acres of um, green space on the combined, you know, the combined uh, veterans and Mado site, and more than that um, would be compensated by putting a restriction on the entirety of, there's already a restriction on the Parsons site, but the piece that encompasses the school use right now at East Gloucester. Um, if you want to go further detailed to exactly what those numbers look like, um, again, part of left field is on the school site right now. It's not encumbered. You've heard, you heard from Chip, again, the reason why this petition is before you. Um, the Mados parcel itself is, is about 2.3 acres, and all of the land that's uh, at, at the East Gloucester site that's not currently part of the playground and restricted um, is about uh, 2.8 acres. So any way you want to look at it, um, there's more land at the end of the day that would be restricted as part of this proposal. Um, and um, Chip and I participated in uh, a call with staff from EOEA to present this concept, um, and they were supportive of that as, as satisfying the no net loss provision in their 98 policy. Um, and I think those were most of the questions related to plans. And I don't know if anybody else had any other questions. Are there any other questions? Council Holmgren? Yes, uh, one constituent did bring up uh, the soil quality of a uh, veteran's um, site, and I don't know if um, you are the best person to ask. I'm not an engineer. Um, there, is, there is an engineer on the project as well, um, and, and, and just like you, you have seen um, in other development projects, if the soils are unsuitable, there's often um, soil remediation where you may actually have to remove um, to ensure that you're going to have the structural integrity that you need to put a foundation. Um, so it's certainly something that has been a part of the scope of um, the engineers that are working with Doran Whittier um, to do test pits, um, as well as once that goes further, um, there'll be a lot more evaluation of the site to ensure that they can put a proper foundation in. Yep. Mr. Dunn. I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it, it's funny that particular question came up today in a, <clears throat> in a, in a sit down with the, z the design team and they have recognized that there are some questions about soil suitability on the site, and, and they have already had test pits um, and borings, and they're going to be doing a, a bit more. They've also kind of repositioned the school a little bit based on the knowledge that they've already gleaned. So in terms of where the building is going, they're, they're focused on that, and will have suitable um, um, building um, and construction methods to deal with that if it comes up. Thank you. Thank you both. Councillor Pat. Yes. Um, could I ask Greg to come back again? Yes. J 
just a clarification for everyone on the uh, acreage yep. uh, yes. between uh, both uh, Mados slash Veterans and East Gloucester slash Parsons. Want to make sure the numbers are understood by everyone. Um, correct me if I am incorrect. The Mados field portion that does not at this point belong to the school is 2.2 acres. The entire field with the uh, you know the right field stuff in there would be um, is like 2.7 acres. Then if you go to East Gloucester, the acreage at East Gloucester, if you do not include the Parsons portion that's already deed restricted, mm -hmm. is approximately three acres. Is that correct? We're, I mean, again, these and are I know all, that these there are was all, changes where some yeah. of the building was. We're, we're talking time. about tenths of acres, um, but that's, that's that's about right. Okay. I mean, what I have, have estimated for um, East Gloucester is around 2.8. Um, so again, I, I tried to focus on, you know, again, what we're talking about is Article 97, the Mados parcel, which is around 2.2 to 2.3, and we can get an exact measurement of that. And then everything that's not restricted or part of the Parsons is about 2.8. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Memhard. Greg, if you don't go too far, too quick. Uh, I'm concerned just to clarify what the change will represent in our East Gloucester neighborhood at the current site of the East Gloucester School. Um, once that school, if things move ahead, once that school building is raised with a Z, raised, mm -hmm. um, we will be unencumbering, as I understand it, a portion of the Par Parsons playground, which currently has modular classrooms, about 45 or 50 staff parking lot places, and a gymnasium that's been built in good faith on the Parsons playground. So that in addition to the part of the building that will be removed on the lower part of the lot uh, below Davis Street extension, in fact, we will be recovering a portion of the, of the Parsons playground that has been encroached upon. And, and the extent of that encroachment, I'm not sure, but there was also an action by the Gloucester City Council in 1948 that actually took a strip from the Parsons original parcel and allowed it for school use. So you are correct. You know, part of that when that structure comes down, um, there will there will be some portion of and, and that 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 structure and parking, uh, when that's restored, will also be restoring a portion of that as well. And I just want to it's it's not at the Veteran School Webster at Webster Street location, but it is a net gain in terms of yes. green recreation space for the city and for our, our constituents. And that's, and that's the graphics, and again, I'll call them graphics, that were a part of the packet um, that Chip had forwarded to the council. That was really just looking at the net of green space versus restored, removing everything that was essentially built on that. And again, the delta is, is much greater on the East Gloucester site. Thank you. Should I walk away? Are there any other councilor questions? Vanessa, would you like to say something? Good evening, councilors. I'm Vanessa Krozik, Mayor's Office. On behalf of the Mayor's Office, and to be very clear, the city is fully committed to relocating and rededicating Mados Field to Green Street. We want to assure you, and we want to assure all of you, that his memory will be honored. Preliminary planning has already begun. The Mayor has asked our DPW Director to survey the land and take into consideration field build-out, as well as options in regards to amenities, the backstop, fencing, accessibility, lighting, and parking. As it relates to parking, we've actually already had preliminary discussions with Sam Park about easement access from Gloucester Crossing. We're getting excited about these possibilities, and ha as we get more information, we will share it with you and with all of you. The city administration strongly supports this petition, and we ask that you vote in favor of it tonight to, among other things, clear the path to let Gloucester residents decide the outcome in November. A new school would benefit the city by providing a modern learning environment and giving modern amenity to our children and reducing long-term maintenance costs. It's a smart investment for the future of our city. 
Our chil Gloucester's children deserve it and their future depends on it. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sapphire for a few final brief remarks. Dr. Sapphire. And good evening. Um, a brief uh, recap and then uh, some comments to follow. Um, first, the MSBA will not approve this project. They will not approve the schematic design unless the school committee has possession of the property. There must be a clear path before the MSBA will allow a project to move forward. The school committee must have site control, as said, before the project can move forward. Without that, no board approval. Therefore, the district would not be able to proceed with this project. Article 97 is a technical procedure. It's insurance regarding the preservation of open spaces, the avoidance of potential litigation, and it provides a clear path for MSBA board approval. With respect to the legislative session, there is a window within which the legislature's votes can get done. They do not meet in July, so the last session, based on the timeline we have now with a November vote, would be in June. Best case, city approval of the land transfer would take place before the end of June. MSBA approval would take place in August. They meet every other month in time for the November vote by the city at large. These actions and this measure will bring us to the end of a three years plus process to develop this project and will lead us to the decision by the community as whether or not to move forward uh, in November. Further delay, as Mr. Dunn mentioned, will be costly due to rising construction costs, 4% historically, 8% today in some of the trades with a possible increase, as said before, of two to $4 million. Furthermore, no private property will be taken for this project, and as uh, Mr. Katamatori said, that uh, the city is prepared to put that in writing. The softball field or fields will be reproduced or relocated. And another sensitive issue, what was dedicated can and will be rededicated thoughtfully and respectfully. What has been given little attention in last night and tonight's conversation are the needs of Gloucester children, and Vanessa began to address that. How we educate our children has changed considerably since our five elementary schools were built. Space for special education, Title I services, dedicated art, music, and physical education spaces along with physical and occupational therapy space, libraries, hands-on project space, meeting and collaboration space, adequate administrative health and storage, not to mention appropriately sized classrooms and adequate hallways are all issues given only slight consideration or not considered at all when those elementary schools were built in the 40s and 50s. The lack of these elements handcuffs our teachers from performing their job well and deprives our students of the best education we can provide. The reality of 21st century education and life has dramatically changed what we expect of our buildings. Technology, for example, must be firmly integrated into all aspects of the building. The buildings should be fuel efficient and provide good lighting. In today's world, they must be designed to maximize safety and security for our children, as well as accessible to children with disabilities. There should be capacity for safe access to and from schools by foot, car, or by bus. And there should also be amenities for our employees and adequate staff bathrooms, workrooms, break rooms, etc. So with those issues in mind, and with the rest of the 21st century, and the well-being of our children of Gloucester in mind, I urge you to move this technical question, Article 97, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sapphire. Are there any more questions from the council? Council O'Hara? A question I think Chip might be the... Could you tell me how far a new school can be from a liquor store or a liquor establishment? I don't know off the top of my head, Counselor. I could find out for you, um, but I don't know. Okay, because there is an establishment very close. Mm -hmm. By my research, it's within the boundaries. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so that concludes um, the 
portion, um, unless the council or you, Mr. President, have any other questions. I do want to qualify uh, one thing that Dr. Sapphire said. The last day of the legislative session is July 31st, not June 30th. Um, thank you, Chip. Uh, Councilor Gilman, are there any more questions before we head to the committee report? All right, Councilor Gilman, can we have the committee report, please? Thank you, Councilor. On a motion by Councilor Holmgren, seconded by Councilor Pett, the Planning and Development Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend the City Council request that the state legislature's tours uh, file a petition on behalf of the City of Gloucester requesting that the general court authorize the City of Gloucester to use certain land known and numbered as 11 Webster Street which includes Meadows Field and is held by the city pursuant to deeds recorded at book 2599 comma page 151 in book 2867 comma page 34 in the Southern Essex District Registry of Deeds for Municipal School Purposes without 97 restrictions on such use provided that the legislature may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any, uh, any narrative, Councillor? Um, I'd, I'd like to make an amendment, if you... If you will. Sure. Um, I move to amend the main motion by inserting after the words for municipal school purposes the following. In exchange, the city will use and hold the East Gloucester school site known and numbered as 8 Davis Street and comprising of approximately three acres for public park and open space purposes, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. So that was the, um, that was the amendment, so back to the main motion. Okay. So let me read my narrative. Counselors, the MSBA process for a new elementary school began about three and a half years ago. Um, there were many MSBA deadlines that both the City Council and the Building Committee and School Committee have had to comply with. Part of the process was, was the selection of the site, which was completed and voted by the School Building Committee and also by the School Committee. Article 97, as the Superintendent stated, is a technical matter and is now in front of the City Council. The matter was in front of P&D on February 5th, 2020. Resident questions were answered by administration and are reflected in the minutes. At that time, we agreed to have an additional public hearing, which was held last night, February 23rd, 2020. I'm sorry, February 24th, 2020. The article of the Mass Constitution was ratified in 1972, providing for the protection of open space from changes in use and development um, with the approval of a two-thirds vote of each branch of the state legislature. In order for the city to use any property that has Article 97 protection, the city would need to replace it with a comparable piece of property of equal or greater fair market value so that there is, not, there is a no net loss of open space in Gloucester. Our motion coming out of P&D, um, once it is voted by two-thirds of this council, will be taken up with the legislatures, both the House and the Senate. Time is of the essence as they will break the end of June. They too will need a two-thirds vote. Once that is approved, then the City Council will vote on the transfer of care, custody, management, and control from the DPW to the School Committee per MGL Section 40, Article 15A. And at that time, there will be another public hearing on the MSBA school project. This all needs to happen in order for the project to move forward. In other words, the school committee, as the superintendent stated, must have site control first in order for our district to proceed with the MSBA process. 
The deadline for the MSBA vote on our project is in August in anticipation of a November debt exclusion override vote to fund the new school. Council is at this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Council President LeBlanc so we can further discuss Article 97 prior to voting on this matter. Thank you. Is there any other discussion before we take the vote this evening? Councillor Cox. Let's see if I can get my mic to work. Um, while it's inappropriate for me to make an amendment um, tonight, I do want to assure that there will be an amendment offered when we go to dispose of the land, saying that if in November the city votes the school in a negative, so a no vote if the school does not pass the override, um, that the land revert back to DPW and back to Article 97 protection. Um, it, again, it is inappropriate for me to make the m amendment tonight, but that is the plan. Um, so that way, there are securities in place if the, the city does not vote for the new school override. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Is there anybody, Cox, is there anybody else? Councillor Pat. Just a um, quick uh, reminder that, as I said last night, um, it was not necessary for a vote to happen last night, and it's not part of the necessity for the vote tonight. But when you reference the current um, parts of Meadows Field, including um, the uh, lights, et cetera, when we make a land transfer, we will ensure that um, the agreement between uh, the city and the school department does not um, take the lights, et cetera, away, that those will be utilized um, for a replacement of that field, et cetera. Um, but that, that type of vote and uh, commitment will be taken at another time. Thank you, Councillor Pat. Is there anybody else that would like to speak before the vote? So we have a motion, we have a second. Um, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll call, please? Councillor Nolan. Yes. Councilor O'Hara. No. Councilor Pat. Yes. Councilor McCox. Yes. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Hogram. Yes. Councilor LeBlanc. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Memhard. Yes. City Council motion to request that the state legislatures file a petition on behalf of the city regarding 11 Webster Street for the purposes specified, passes on a vote of eight in favor, one opposed. Council Holmgren. I'd like to move that we reconsider this vote. Second. So there's been a motion to reconsideration. Um, we're all familiar with the reconsideration. So it's the opposite of what you just voted. Uh, Madam Clerk, can we call the roll call, please? Councilor Nolan. No. Councilor O'Hara. Yes. Councilor Cox. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Pat. Pat. I'm sorry. I jumped the gun. Accepted. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Councilor Cox. No. Councilor Gilman. No. Councilor Holgram. No. Councilor Blank. No. Councilor McCarthy? No. And Councilor Memhard? No. Motion for reconsideration fails. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Madam Clerk, can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business is Public Hearing 2020 003, Loan Order 2020 001, Loan Authorization Request for Water Capital Projects in the amount of $3,300,000. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'd like to open the public hearing and uh, ask uh, for those to speak in favor. Mr. Dunn. Good evening again. Um, Mike Hale cannot be here this evening, so I am Mike Hale, junior or senior, I guess. Um, so we have two loan orders. This is the first of the two before you tonight. 
Um, one is for water work and one is for sewer work. And basically this is anticipating the um, sp spring, summer, fall construction season. Um, so we want to get these um, move forward such that we can put contracts on the street um, and then we're going to be ready to go once the weather, well, the weather has been pretty good, once it definitely turns. Um, in the case of the water projects, $3.3 million. Um, the big piece of this is the Briar Neck water main replacement and relining. Um, we're also going to be doing some dam intake improvements, a final design on the BAPS and aeration project, some sand media replacement, and the production of an emergency action plan for dams. Um, other than the big Briar Neck project, um, these are basically just additional chapters in ongoing projects. Thank you, John. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor of this? Is there anyone that would speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any communications? There are none. All right, so I'm going to close the public hearing and ask for the committee report. Councillor Cox. On a motion by Councillor... Uh, Budget and Finance, you voted unanimously to recommend the City Council approve the following loan authorization as follows. Ordered that the City of Gloucester appropriates $3,300,000 to pay costs associated with various water improvement projects, including but not limited to Briar Neck, water mains, the Babson Water Filtration Plant, various water res reservoir intake structures and valves, and for sand filter media replacement, including costs incidental or related thereto. To meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 44, or pursuant to any other enabling authority. The mayor and any other appropriate official of the city are authorized to apply for, accept, and expand any grants or gifts that may be available to the city to pay costs of the project. Any premium received by the city upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of such costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the Mass General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay for such costs by a like amount. Further ordered that the treasurer is authorized to file an application with the Municipal Finance Oversight Board to qualify under Chapter 44A of the General Laws any or all of the bonds authorized by this order to provide such information and execute such documents as the Municipal Finance Oversight Board may require for these purposes, and I so move. And I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any narrative, Councillor Cox? Um, I think CFO Dunn was uh, appropriate in his explanation. Um, I, I can't see any other. Hmm? Is there any discussion? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Oh, it's a roll call. I'm sorry. Um, roll call. Madam Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Okay. Can I just mention there are no communications on this? Okay. Councillor Nolan? Yes. Councilor O'Hara? Yes. Councilor Pat? Yes. Councilor Cox? Yes. Councilor Gilman? Yes. Councilor Holbrum? Yes. Councilor Blank? Yes. Councilor McCarthy? Yes. And Councilor Memham? Yes. The City Council motion to approve the loan authorization request for ca water capital projects in the amount of $3,300,000 passes on a vote of nine in favor of zero opposed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business is public hearing 2020-004, loan order 2020-002, loan, loan authorization request for sewer capital projects in the amount of 3730000 I'd like to open the public hearing and ask if there's anybody that speak in favor. Um, yes, there is. Um, good evening again, councillors. Um, so here is the sewer portion of the um, annual improvements. Um, 
$3,730,000. Again, um, Mike Hale wants to get these out there and begin to bring in bids in order to be able to get at these as quickly as possible once the weather changes. Um, the, the projects that he's looking at here are improvements to the Riverside and Nile sewer pump stations, um, some upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant, which again requires basically almost annual upgrades to make, make sure that it's working properly. Um, utility master planning and SCADA improvements. So SCADA is basically <clears throat> the alarm system that is hooked up to all of the various pump stations to let people know if a pump station fails, if there's a power failure, um, if there's a clog, or for some reason it's not working properly. But a very important um, function of the entire system is for all of those various pump stations throughout the city to communicate if there's an issue. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anybody who would like to speak in opposition? Seeing none, are, are there any communications, Madam Clerk? There are none. Council of Questions? I'd like to close the public hearing and call for the committee report, please. Councilor Cox. Budget and Finance voted unanimously to recommend the City Council approve the following loan authorization as follows. Ordered that the City of Gloucester appropriates $3,700,000 $30,000 to pay costs associated with various sewer improvement projects, including but not limited to WPCF upgrades, Riverside and Niles pump stations, utility master planning and SCADA upgrades, including costs incidental or related thereto. To meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44 or pursuant to any other enabling authority. The mayor or any other appropriate official of the city are authorized to apply for, accept, and expand any gifts, grants that may be available to the city to pay costs of the project. Any premium received by the city upon sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote lest any such premium applied to the payment of the cost issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the, math of the General Law, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by like amount. Further ordered that the Treasurer is authorized to file an application with the Municipal Finance Oversight Board to qualify under Chapter 44A of the General Law's any or all of the bonds authorized by this order and to provide such information and execute such documents as the Municipal Finance Oversight Board may require for these purposes, and I so move. And I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any narrative? No. Is there any council discussion? Madam Clerk, can we call the roll call, please? Council Nolan is absent, so Council O'Hara. Yes. Council Pat. Yes. Council Cox? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. Council Holgram? Yes. Councilor Blank? Yes. Councilor McCarthy? Yes. Councilor Memhard? Yes. City Council motion to approve loan authorization request for sewer capital projects in the amount of $3,730,000 passes on a vote of eight in favor and one absent. Thank you. Um, I just want to let everybody know Councilor Nolan wasn't feeling good, so. Uh, he stayed for the majority part of the meeting and um, he left because he wasn't feeling good. So that's why he left this evening. Um, Madam Clerk, can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business is public hearing to 2020-005 to amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 20, Shellfish, Sea Worms, and Eels, Section 3, Definitions. Section 5, Taking Shellfish from Contaminated Areas. Section 7, Closing of Flats of Shellfish, taking section 29 fees section 30 limits subsection a shellfish commercial and section 30 limits subsection b and shellfish non-commercial i'd like to open the public hearing and ask if there's anybody that would like to speak in favor welcome peter good evening um uh, name and address for the record please peter Zonar, shellfish constable uh, Full Fire Street, Rockport. So most of these are just um, general housekeeping. 
Uh, the first one, section three, is just updating the definition to include uh, periwinkles and conch swells and moon snails in the definition of shellfish uh, by statutory definition pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 130, Section 1. They fall within the authority of the municipality to manage. The next one, Section 25, uh, at more housekeeping. Uh, we want to amend the ordinance to state that no person shall take shellfish from areas classified as conditionally approved while in the closed status as defined by the Div Division of Marine Fisheries due to rain, red tide, pollution, or severe weather events. The current ordinance only addresses areas classified as prohibited and restricted. Um, Gloucester has the majority of our areas are classified as conditionally approved. Um, they're open or closed, and that determination is made by the D Division of Marine Fisheries due to water quality. Um, currently, we're enforcing it on state law when, uh, because we don't have an, any ordinance that allows us to uh, enforce it. Chapter 27, same thing. No person shall take shellfish from areas closed during those times. Tides of days that shellfish harvest is prohibited due to a municipal management plan. Uh, we have several shellfish areas that are closed on certain days or, um, or tides by our uh, management plan versus a marine fisheries plan. Uh, we don't have any ordinance to prevent illegal harvest during the times that these flats are closed. Um, The next one is chapter 20, section 29. Uh, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, chapter 130, section 52 states, such city or town shall not charge a veteran a fee greater than the fee charged to a resident of such city or town. I just request that we include a military veteran, non-resident, non-commercial shellfish and sea worm permit at the same rate as a resident, non-commercial shellfish and sea, per sea worm permit. Uh, for fifty dollars versus two hundred. The next uh, ordinance amendment is Chapter Twenty, Section Thirty B, limits non-commercial to include the wording: No person shall have in his or her possession surf clams less than five inches in the longest diameter of the shell to an amount of more than five percent of any batch. This limits pursuant to three two two CMR six decimal zero eight. Um, we currently prohibit commercial harvest of surf clams, but we do allow uh, recreational harvest. And uh, per 322 CMR, the minimum size limit for surf clams is five inches to the longest diameter of the shell. And the final one, chapter 20, section 30A, uh, our current limit is 200 pounds per tide including sack weight of any of all kinds of shellfish. Um, at the Shellfish Advisory Commission meeting of November 26, 2019, a vote of three in favor, one absent. The daily allowable harvest of shellfish, they wanted to raise from 200 to 300 pounds per tide uh, at Ordinance Administration. Uh, Council of Blank recommended we increase from 200 to 250 pounds per tide. So let me just brief everybody what uh, Pete just did up here. So he just gave an overview of all the ordinances that um, ONA voted for uh, a couple of weeks ago. So instead of taking each item individually, he just gave us a briefing of all of them and uh, one ball of wax. So basically what Pete's trying to do is um, bring our shellfish ordinance up with mass general law. There's a lot of things that our uh, shellfishing ordinance doesn't have, so these are enforcements that um, Pete and our shellfish constables can enforce on the flats. So basically that's what, we, what he's done this evening. So are there any questions for, uh, actually? All right, so that's that for now. All right. Um, is there anybody that would like to speak in opposition? Uh, are there any communications? There are none. Are there any councilor questions? Councilor Pat. Uh, not a question, just wanted to thank Pete for, for his tremendous work of, um, you know, going through all of the regulations and updating us so the city of Gloucester is on par um, with the Commonwealth of Mass, not only for compliance, but also for enforcement so that we can go ahead and protect 
uh, our shellfish uh, in, the, in the appropriate way. And I want to thank him for his work. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? Any questions for Pete? Councilor Gilman? Um, just while he is here, um, Pete, you, were, you don't have to come up, but I just wanted to comment that you did a really good job notifying everybody when the beds were contaminated, and we appreciate that. I know my ward um, was one of the areas that was restricted, and your constant updates was really appreciated, so thank you. Um, I'd like to commend you, too. This is long overdue, uh, being a recreational commercial fisherman at the moment, uh, but I had been a commercial uh, shell fisherman for a number of years um, to see what goes on out there and the um, lack of um, enforcement with you know these not being in place and now that we have them, what we'll be able to do. So um, I just commend you too for taking the time and going through this and, and bringing us up to code uh, where we should be. So uh, great job, Pete. We appreciate it. So if there's nothing else, I'd like to close the public hearing and call for the committee report, which would be me. Sean's not here this evening. Um, so we're going to go through these. These are just a uh, simple majority. Ordinance administration voted unanimously to recommend that the city council amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 20, Shellfish, Sea Worms, and Eels, Section 3, definitions by striking period and adding after the words sea scallop as follows. Winkles, carnivorous snails, including conchs, whelks, and moon snails, and I so move. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Next one. Ordinance administration voted unanimously to recommend that the city council amend GCO chapter 20, self shellfish, sea worms, and eels, section 5, taking shellfish from contaminated areas by adding subsection C, as follows, subsection C, no person shall take shellfish from areas classified as conditionally approved while in closed status as defined by the State Division of Marine Fisheries due to rain, red tide, pollution, or severe weather events. And I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Moving right along. Ordinance Administration voted unanimously to recommend that the City Council amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 20, Shellfish, Sea Worms, and Eels, Section 7, Closing of Flats for Shellfishing, taking by adding a last sentence to the section as follows. No person shall take shellfish from areas closed during those times, tides, or days that shellfish harvest is prohibited due to the Municipal Management Plan, and I so move. So any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I feel like them like she shall shally sh shall she shalls by <laughs> oh my goodness. Shush, 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 yeah. There's too many shushes in this. Um, moving right along, ordinance administration voted unanimously to recommend that the city council amend Gossip Code of Ordinances, chapter twenty, shellfish, sea worms, and eels, section twenty-nine, fees by adding subsection twelve. Military veterans, non-residents, non-commercial shellfish, and sea worms at the rate of $50, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Ordinance administration voted unanimously to recommend that the City Council amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 20, Shellfish, Sea Worms, and Eels, Section 30, Limits, Subsection A, Shellfish, Commercial, by striking the number 200 and adding the number 250, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is any discussion? Um, I'd like to just touch on this real quick. So the Shellfish Advisory Committee voted to um, have 300. Uh, being a shell fisherman myself, that 300 is a really big number, and it's um, it could cause some really dam uh, some some harm to the flats with people digging that much. Um, so I've talked to our shellfish warden. Uh, we had a brief discussion to start off at 250, um, see how that goes for a little while, and then if that goes well and there's no harm done to the flats, then we can bump it up to 300, rather than starting at the 300 and seeing harm done and then knocking it back to 50, but the harm that's already happened is just 
it's, it's, it'll, it's gonna take a while to replenish itself. So we figured that it would be easier to start at 250 and go up rather than starting at the top and coming back down. So that's uh, just the narrative on that. So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Um, last one. Ordinance Administration voted unanimously to recommend that the City Council amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 20, Shellfish, Sea Worms, and Eels, Section 30, Limits, Subsection B, Shellfish Non-Commercial, by striking the word 2 and adding the word 5, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Dana. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. And give us one second while we look through our, our committee report. We did section A, section 30A and section 30B. Yes, we did. Okay. All right, so that concludes the uh, committee report for ordinance administration. Uh, Madam Clerk, can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business, public hearing 2020-006 to amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 10, Waterways Administration, Section 87, Harbor Master Patrol details by striking subsections B and C and adding new subsections B and C. I'd like to open the public hearing and ask if there's anybody that would like to speak in favor. Our Harbor Master, T.J. Shimataro. Good evening. Uh, as you guys are aware, a few years ago, I brought uh, forward this detail 1080 or this uh, detail ordinance 1087. When I assumed the position as harbor master, there was no ordinance in effect for the harbor master's office to perform details and, and get paid for them. Um, that, that presented itself a problem. There's a lot of work going on on the waterfront. Some of things include details. We just had two weeks straight of around the clock 24 seven details at the train bridge through a captain of the port order due to the uh, channel closure. Um, so at the time it was kind of a sense of urgency. I put a, de I put a detail ordinance forward. It really wasn't enough uh, meat and potatoes, if you will. Um, after some discussion with the HR director, over this past off season, she recommended um, that I, I clarify a few things and, and strengthen the ordinance and make it um, a little more um, in line with other departments that uh, conduct details like the police department. So it's kind of long and drawn out and it breaks down per person per hour. Um, it's very similar to the police department's ordinance. I worked with them and I worked with a, a, a similar at, uh, in neighboring Harbor Master's office in Salem and kind of modeled it off of what they do. They're comparable to Gloucester. They run a similar program and have similar situations. So this is just getting us to where we need to be, cleaning up some language and making it more defined uh, for not only the city, but for the, uh, the companies in which require details and um, the legalities behind that. So. That's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions pertaining? Not just yet. So we're going to uh, do go through the public hearing. All right. Thanks. All right. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anybody that would like to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, are there any communications? There are none. No communications. Do we have any councilor questions? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and I will read the committee report all right uh, try to get through this as quickly as possible ordinance administration voted unanimously to recommend that the City Council amend Gloucester Code of Ordinances chapter 10 waterways administration section 87 harbor masters patrol de patrol details by striking subsections B and C and adding as follows Subsection B, the harbor master shall charge a fee of $105 per hour for the use of a vessel and two assistant harbor masters during daytime hours, um, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., and a fee of $145 for an hour for nighttime hours from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. In the event that the supervisors are required 
the harbor master shall charge a fee of $125 an hour during daylight hours and $175 for nighttime hours. Subsection B, hourly rates as follows. Subsection one, a flat fee of $40 per assistant harbor master plus $25 an hour for use of each vessel needed during daylight hours with a minimum of shift of four hours. If the detail exceeds four hours, it shall be a minimum of eight hours. And if the detail exceeds eight hours, it should be an hourly charge until 8 p.m. Subsection two, a flat fee of $60 per hour per assistant harbor master plus $25 for each use of a vessel needed during nighttime hours with a minimum shift of four hours. If the detail exceeds four hours, it shall be a minimum of eight hours. And if the detail exceeds eight hours, it shall be an hourly charge until 6 a.m. Subsection three, a flat fee of $50 per hour per supervisor plus $25 for use of each vessel needed during, for, for $25 per hour for each vessel needed during daylight hours with a minimum of shift of four hours if the detail exceeds four hours, it shall be a minimum of eight hours, and if the detail exceeds eight hours, it shall be an hourly charge until 8 p.m. Subsection four, a flat fee of $57 per hour per supervisor, supervisory plus $25 an hour for use of each vessel needed during nighttime hours with a minimum shift of four hours. If the detail exceeds four hours, it shall be a minimum of eight hours, and if the detail exceeds eight hours, it shall be an hourly charge until 6 p.m., 6 a.m., I'm sorry, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Councilor Cox. Dana, on subsection four, it says supervisory. It should just strike the Y. Because the other one says supervisor. And I do have a question for TJ, if you don't mind. Absolutely, TJ. Yes. Um, why utilize the word supervisor instead of just harbor master? Because the, the first two say clearly specify assistant supervisor. Well, there's, there a dep there's a deputy okay. harbor master, so, so it's just under supervisor. Okay, so it's assistant, deputy, and then yourself. Correct, and it's kind of similar language to what others that will be hiring the details are used to instead of the dark jargon of harbor master, deputy, assistant, so we just use supervisor. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? <laughs> Seeing none. Um, and this is a just a regular vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, TJ. Um, Madam Clerk, can we, can we have the next order of business, please? Next order of business is Public Hearing 2020-007, a group free petition under City Charter Section 9-1B requesting expanding surf access at Good Harbor Beach. What's that? All right, so um, who likes to surf? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna explain a couple of things to you guys this evening. Um, so we'll have a lead uh, presenter uh, up to 15 minutes. We'll try to, try to be brief, um, and, and if anybody would like to come up and speak after that, we'll give you three minutes. Um, so there isn't going to be any action from us this evening. So we're here to listen to you. It's a listening post for us, and uh, we'll open the um, we'll open the public hearing and ask if there's anybody that would like to speak in favor. Uh, uh, name and address for the record, please. And if uh, anybody has one more thing, and if anybody has anything written, could you please leave it with our clerk of committees on our desk, please? Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be submitting um, tomorrow morning or t this evening. Um, before we get started, um, well, my name is Courtney Hayes. I'm a Gloucester resident. I live at 1057 Washington Street. 
Um, before we get started, I wanted to recognize and thank all the surfers, ocean lovers, and their families who are here tonight to support our proposal for expanded surf access at Good Harbor Beach. Please stand up. Woo. Thank you. So again, my name is Courtney Hayes. I'm a surfer, video producer, and resident of Gloucester. I'm also a member of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. The Cape Ann Surfers Union is a grassroots organization uh, devoted to expanded ocean access for Cape Ann surfers and the promotion of a healthy and safe ocean environment for all. Since its inception in June 2019, CASU has grown to over 200 members held seven meetings, organized three beach cleanups, and led ocean health and plastic pollution awareness campaigns. Our members range from ages 10 to 80. We are boys, girls, men, and women from diverse backgrounds who share a love for surfing in the ocean. We are here tonight to propose expanded summer surfing access at Good Harbor Beach. In the last five years, our local surfing community has grown exponentially. Good Harbor Beach is a public resource, and we believe that surfing regulations should reflect this increased demand for access. We also believe that expanded summer surfing hours offer Cape Ann residents and visitors a wealth of economic, environmental, health, and wellness benefits. As is the case at many New England beaches, surfers and swimmers can safely coexist if managed properly. Let's start by taking a look at best practices from other New England beaches. Hi, my name is John Del Rosario. I live at Five Wise Place. I'm a warranty administrator, surfer, surf instructor, resident of Gloucester, and a member of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. As you will see from the following examples, both surfers and swimmers are able to safely enjoy popular beaches in the busy summer months. If there is a safety issue, surfing is discontinued at any of these beaches with the, at the discretion of the lifeguards. Let's quickly review the details of how these beaches safely manage summer access for both surfers and swimmers. Best practices, starting with, starting with Jenna's Beach up in Rye, New Hampshire. Jenna's, Wallace Sands, and Sawyer are all on one strip. They separate out sections where they have safe swimming zones and separated surfing zones that are designated. Surfers are required to stay at least 50 feet away from the swimmers. Lifeguards whistle them out. There are areas marked by flags. The next beach local to them would be Hampton Beach, also known as the Wall. So this is North Beach, not the main one. It's the concrete walled one, the next north from the Boar's Head. Surfers have year-round access. Actually, all of these beaches, the surfers have year-round access off-season. Can I get you just to like, just a step as back. hair back? Yeah, because okay. you're we'll right into it and it's, it's muffled, yes. All right, so these, all these beaches have, surfers have access during the off-season, but during the on-season, height of the season, this is what they all do. So Hampton has their section, same thing, where they've flagged off areas between 8th and 14th streets. The surfers have that section where they surf. Swimmers can swim with the surfers, but same thing, the surfers have more of the priority where they can surf and the swimmers are at their risk, whereas they can't go into the other way. Um, in Maine, you have Higgins Beach and Gooch's Beach. Both of these beaches are similar in size to Good Harbor. <clears throat> Higgins Beach from June 15th to September 15th is allowed, surfing is allowed from 11 to 5. At Gooch's Beach, the surfers have access year-round for the entire season. When we get into Rhode Island, we have Narragansett Beach. Surfers have year-round access within a surfing zone, <clears throat> within a surfing zone. Swimming allowed in an area in front of the lifeguard stands designated swimming only. Easton, surfers have year-round access with a surfing zone designated. I cannot pronounce Sachusett, I think, but it's also known as Second Beach down in Newport. 
whereas year-round access in a zone as well. Um, westerly, the town beach is June through October, 10 to 6 in their zones. For Massachusetts, we don't have too many to go by. For an example, we have Nahant down uh, just south of us where they have openings from 9.30 to 4 every day, but in a certain area. And then when we get to the only local mass surf zones that are free and clear, when you get down to Cape Cod, where they have 10 beaches, and they have year-round access, there's no limitations. We didn't jump onto the vineyard in Nantucket, but similar to their um, regulations for how they have surfing. So I will pass it on to Aaron. Good evening. My name's Aaron Thomas. I live at 10 Loma Drive in Gloucester. I'm a surfer, bank manager, resident of Gloucester, and a member of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. Gloucester's current surfing policy is outlined in Article 3, subsection H2 of the Beach and Stage 4 Park Gloucester Regulations, and states surfing is prohibited between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. from Memorial Day to Labor Day without permission of the lifeguard. As we look at this access issue, it's important to understand that surfing a good harbor is tide and weather dependent. Therefore, a nine to five ban effectively means no surfing if optimal conditions fall during that window. The Cape Ann Surfers Union began meeting last summer to discuss ways to improve access. We all agreed that we would not ask for all day full beach surfing because of safety concerns on busy summer days. However, we believe our proposal offers safe access for both swimmers and surfers and consistent with, as is consistent with best practices from other New England beaches that allow surfing. Courtney will now take a few minutes to talk through proposed details of our uh, regulation changes. Thank you. Um, we'd first like to propose an extension of all day full beach surf access through June 30th, not Memorial Day. The water and air temps in June can be very cold and there are many days with few or no swimmers in the water. Lifeguards could call surfers out of the water using a red flag system if the beach becomes too crowded with swimmers at any time. Additionally, we'd like to request all day full beach surf access on bad weather days with few swimmers from July 1st through Labor Day. Bad weather surf days would be at the lifeguard's discretion. A green flag system could be used to signal surfing allowed. We would also like to extend full beach surf access until 11 a.m. from July 1st through Labor Day. Lifeguards can call surfers out of the water earlier if the beach becomes too crowded with swimmers. Finally, we suggest creating a surf zone from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. July 1st through Labor Day on the creek end of the beach. <clears throat> Again, lifeguards can call surfers out of the water if the beach becomes too crowded with swimmers at any time. A red flag system could be used to signal no surfing allowed anywhere. Um, as you can see, we're um, showing you an aerial view of what a surf zone at Good Harbor Beach might look like. Um, first we see low tide and then high tide. And um, this view includes the view from Nautilus Road, and then finally, a surf zone. Ultimately, we are asking for more access at times when the beach is underutilized. <clears throat> Ward Councilor Scott Memhard has met with the Cape Ann surfers on several occasions on several occasions and suggest we consider some or all of these changes as a pilot program for summer 2020. DPW Director Mike Hale agreed that a sunset clause could be written into any regulation changes. It's also worth noting that the proposed changes will have little or no budgetary impact. Question? Hi, I'm Christian Del Rosario. I uh, live in 8 Forest Street in Manchester, Mass. Um, I've been surfing here in Gloucester for 33 years. Um, I own a local surf shop here on Main Street, Safari, and I'm a member of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. Um, surfing as a sport has grown around the globe, reaching every nook and cranny and coastline that you can imagine. Um, as a business, surfing has evolved into a multi-billion dollar global industry encompassing manufacturing, fashion, media, tourism, and adventure travel. 
Surfers contribute significantly to the economies of communities they visit. Here in the U.S., there's a growing population of 3.3 3 million surfers that is estimated to spend between $1.9 and $3.1 billion annually on just local surf trips by simply going surfing at their favorite local or home surf spots. For a dedicated group of surfers in Gloucester and from the surrounding communities, Good Harbor Beach is that local go-to spot that people go to every day. Here you can see a surf infographic for some surf, surf economics. Um, this is it from a 2001 Surfrider Foundation survey. It provides a picture of our significant spending power. Breaking out the data regionally, surfers in the Northeast have a median annual income of $75,000 and spend, on average, $69 per surf trip. Surfers are also an important segment of the coastal tourism sector. Their surfing-related expenditures benefit local economies. Unfortunately, during the summer here in Gloucester, those surf tourists and their dollars head elsewhere during the summer because of current surfing regulations which usually means people head north to Hampton, Salisbury, Agunquit, York, or south to Rhode Island, and the Cape. Um, hopefully, we can do something about that. Um, and on to Aaron. My name is Asher Souter. I'm a surfer, fifth grade student, Gloucester resident, and a member of the Cape Band Surfers Union. I live on 1088 Washington Street in Gloucester. My name is Erin Kniff. I'm a surfer, physical education and wellness teacher at Rockport Elementary School. I'm a Gloucester resident. I live at 32 Bennett Street North in Gloucester and a member of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. We'd like to talk about the environmental health and wellness benefits of surfing. Surfing is fun. It's a great way to be physically active and enjoy one of the gems of Cape Ann, Good Harbor Beach. Increasing opportunities to surf would benefit our community by supporting an activity that builds physical and emotional health, fosters a sense of belonging and positive social connections. The latest neuroscience research shows that being near, in, or on the water can make you happy, more connected, and better at what you do. At a time when anxiety and depression are increasing dramatically among our youth and adults, surfing can build perseverance, resilience, and confidence. Surfing is an, an inclusive activity and powerful tool for healing. The national organization Waves of Impact and Cape Ann Sup hosted a special Surfers Day this past fall at Good Harbor, and many members of CASU volunteered to help surfers with challenges experience the joy of riding a wave. The Stokes shared that day left a lasting impact on all. Surfers are also stewards of the environment and take care of our local beaches. This past year, Cape Ann Surfers Union organized three beach cleanups and even created a wave float made of beach trash that we pulled on a bike at the Horribles Parade and used as a powerful talking point with local youth groups around environmental awareness. Increasing summer access will mean that more people will be able to participate in the positive health and wellness and environmental benefits that surfing can bring to their lives. Thanks, Christine. My name is Christine Manning. I live at 15 Uncas Road in Gloucester. I am an office manager with years of experience in the action sports industry, surfing, skating, cycling. A Gloucester resident, surfer, and member of Cape Ann Surfers Union. Cape Ann Surfers Union is committed to maximizing the safety for everyone who uses Gloucester beaches. According to the World Health Organization and CDC, Drowning is a major public health problem worldwide, worldwide averaging 4,000 deaths per year. The presence of surfers in the water would increase overall safety for swimmers due to the fact that surfers are the closest point of contact to someone who is experiencing difficulty and thus able to assist quickly. In 2015, study, a 2015 study published in the Journal of Accident Analysis and Prevention found that Rescues conducted by surfers are similar to those in numbers by life-saving services. I'd like to now ask if anybody in the audience has actually saved somebody while surfing. If you could stand up, it would be more of an impact. Thank you.
a partnership between Cape Ann Surfers Union and the Gloucester DPW could further extend the positive safety impact of having surfers in the water. Huntington Beach instituted a program, SALT, the Surfers Awareness and Life Saving Technique, that teaches surfers tools to assist in an emergency. Cape and Surfers Union would eagerly support such a program in partnership with the DPW and Gloucester lifeguards to help make our beaches safer for surfers, for swimmers and surfers alike. Thank you for listening. Um, the Cape and Surfers Union looks forward to working with City Council, the DPW, lifeguards, and other city officials to expand access in a way that is beneficial for all that want to enjoy this wonderful public resource, Good Harbor Beach. Thank you. And if anybody's not, anybody's not following us on Cape Ann Surfers Union on Instagram or Facebook, please do so. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor? Step right up to the microphone. Name and address for the record, please. Yeah, don't be shy. Jeff Kelly, 5 Page Street, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, I'm not going to take up my whole three minutes. I just support the, uh, the proposal. I think it's a great idea. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next name and address for the record, please. Sot Scrivener, uh, 1127 Washington Street. And I work with regulatory compliance for an insurance company. So I'm dealing with regulations pretty much all day. And so I'd like to just appeal with you, having been in that atmosphere, there's so much redundancy, there's very little common sense oftentimes, and I think you can see from the proposal, it's not redundant, there's a lot of common sense and consideration, and would bring a lot of uh, expanded happiness and relief and opportunity. Thank you. One second. Courtney, can you put the slide up where the proposals are so we can read through that again? Thank you. Okay, while well, she's doing that, you can uh, you name and address. Hi, name an address my name is Lisa Rigsby. I live um, at 3 Taylor Court in Gloucester. And I just want to say for the record that I'm not part of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. But um, one part of their uh, proposal that really resonated with me was allowing lifeguards to make decisions on um, cloudy days or off days when people are not in water. Because, um, you know, we think about the ocean, at, you know, in Glo and I understand that Good Harbor is a small space, and I've been there many times when it's been packed, mm -hmm. and in high summer when there are lots of swimmers in the water. And um, I think that regarding the entire proposal if as you look at all of the different elements that they're proposing to not throw the surfboard out with the seawater and to look at the different areas that they're speaking about because i think a pilot program could really start with um you know moving the uh, ability of lifeguards to make decisions on when people are surfing would be a great start if you're considering um, looking at the different aspects of the proposal. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron Kniff, 32 Bennett Street North. I'd just like to tag team on what Lisa said. I was a lifeguard. I don't want to date myself, but in the 80s, I was the head lifeguard at Good Harbor. Um, and I just, there's so many days, um, especially. May and June where you're just, the days are so long on the beach and there's just no swimmers. And to give surfers the opportunity to be at the beach and, and participate in such a healthy activity would be such a positive thing. So there are times where it just makes sense and there's times where it doesn't make sense. And I think that the lifeguards are capable of making those decisions. Thank you. Name and address for the record, please. Yep, my name is Keith Kiarsis. I live in Hamilton, Massachusetts, uh, 150 Sagamore Street. 
Um, I wanted to comment on the economic impact piece of it. So I, uh, I'm a surfer. I'm up here year-round. I surfed this morning up at Good Harbor. Um, uh, but my wife and daughter uh, only surf in the summer with me, unfortunately. I can't get them out in the cold. So uh, in the summertime, um, normally, you know, we'd like to come up here. And um, when we do, we usually go out to lunch, do that sort of thing. Um, but in the summer right now, we're, we're generally going up to Hampton. And so when we go up there, we're, you know, we spend the day, we go out to lunch. And we'd prefer to, you know, do that here and bring the money and, you know, to town here. I, I'm out to lunch here all the time myself when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm here surfing. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Name and address for the record, please. I'm Dr. Steve Geary. I'm not much of a public speaker, uh, but I am here. And in spite of the fact that I'm up way past my bedtime. <laughs> I moved to Gloucester in 1975 after uh, finishing my residency and serving as a US Navy doctor during uh, the Vietnam War. I had the privilege of being the chief of radiology at Addison Gilbert Hospital for 25 years. I decided to take up surfing at age 70, and that's why I'm here. I am a member. Yeah. And I'm pushing 80 right now. Uh, I am a member of the Cape Ann Surfers Union. I'm here to uh, vouch for all the people that have spoken and to support their ideas, particularly the economic and the, what I feel would be a positive enhancement of the image of our city because surfing, I believe, is a healthy and fun activity. I have spent many hours at Good Harbor with all these people and I've observed them. They obey the rules. They're considerate of other people in the water and they do the little things that other people don't always notice, such as picking up trash off the beach and picking, picking up trash off the roadway by the Cape Ann Beach Club. I picked up 10 bottles of beer yesterday and recycled them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Name and address, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Combe, 53 Summer Street, Gloucester. So I just wanted to follow up on, you know, kind of how important surfing really is for a lot of us. I really enjoyed um, kind of the medal display and what that meant in terms of the connection with Gloucester for the 400th ceremony. I'd just like to explain to you that, you know, surfing is really our way of being creative, much like a painter or a sculptor might be. And it really kind of fosters a tremendous bond with where we come from, the ocean that really makes Gloucester our home and everything that's always supported us. So I just want to say that it, it's really this kind of deep, deep bond that when I look in this room, everyone sat here for two hours to make sure that you guys could hear how important it is to us because we get up at five in the morning, drive through snowstorms, we embrace all of it. And the few times that there are in the summer to really try to get out there, it's really a bummer when we can't do the thing that we love. So if everyone in here is like totally passionate about surfing, would you stand up? Please, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Name and address, please. Daniel Lord, Six Pools Terrace, Rockport, Mass. You know it's Mass. <laughs> I'm a former uh, educational leader, and currently I'm a working artist in Rockport. I've been a resident of Cape Ann my whole life and I take pride in calling myself a New Englander. I've grown to accept the fact that we don't talk to each other that much at Market Basket, that we drive aggressively, and that we hold fast to our routines. I'm no different. I'm stubborn, I have a fear of people, and I can't stand change. I bought my house 15 years ago after suffering a lasting bout with depression. I was underweight, and I couldn't dip my toes in the ocean on a sweltering hot summer day. However, after observing the grace and athleticism of surfers such as Jamie Hoskett and Aaron Kniff, I knew I had to try. Surfing, for me, became a way out of my own head, a way to connect with something larger than myself, and a way leading directly towards optimal health. The summer swell here is small, 
with rare chest high waves that accompany rainstorms. These are ideal conditions for our youth, our important paying tourists, and those of us that possess a strong inner child. With a reputable surfer slash lifeguard on the beach with a few flags designating a surf zone, individuals will have the opportunity to safely experience surfing. Tori Revulio, arguably Cape Ann's most well-rounded surfer, has experience as a Good Harbor lifeguard and would be a good person to involve in the process of finding a knowledgeable person to manage a surf zone. After 10 years of surfing year-round, my enthusiasm for surfing has yet to yield. I'd say next to marrying my wife, raising my two daughters, and art, surfing is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I only wish to share this transformational experience with everyone, and GHB during the summer is a perfect place to do so. Thank you. Thank you. So is the person that he called out here this evening? Oh, awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, next uh, name and address, please. Colby Kelly, 5 Page Street. Right into the microphone. Colby Kelly, 5 Page Street, Gloucester. Um, I've been surfing for about four or five years now, and um, the group of people are unbelievably welcoming. Just look around, you know. They're sat here for two hours when on a, on a weeknight when they have way better things to do. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Uh, it's crazy. There's not a lot of situations in life when you find a 12-year-old and a 45-year-old standing around down at the beach not missing a beat with each other. And it's just because we're all looking for the same thing, surfing. I'm currently a licensed lifeguard, and I know a lot about the ocean. And I would hands down let any of these people in this room save me without a doubt. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Uh, John Cole, 35 Pigeon Hill Street in Rockport. Uh, I just wanted to comment to Surfer Rescue. Um, I lifeguarded for many years in Southern California, both Tower Guard and Area Supervisor. Um, I can't tell you how many times surfers assisted with rescues or were there in a certain immediate situation where they were able to pull people to a shallower water to get them in, as well as traveling Mexico, other places in the world, and witnessing people, surfers, helping others in need, not specifically other surfers, but swimmers, anybody on the beach. So I just wanted to comment to that. It's pretty universal, and most surfers are willing to jump in, recognize it. They've got an ocean awareness from being in the water that sometimes tower guards that don't have life and a lot of time spent in the ocean don't recognize situations, situations developing um, where surfers can sometimes pick up on that ahead of time and try to support and pull people and help out. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So, uh, so what was your name, Tony? Was that who was the who was the guy in the who's the, Tory? Come on, bud. You don't want to come up and say something? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Because name and address, please. After me. Hi, my name is Bill Mead. I live on Eight Lanthorn Lane in Beverly. If that's allowed for me to come talk here. Um, I've been on the North Shore for thirty-something years. I'm just say I've been surfing for probably fifty years. And way back then, the only people that surfed were crazy young kids. We were dangerous, we had bad habits. And you can see the population has grown up and gotten older. We all have children, we take care of our children. When Dr. Steve and I are in the water alone, just the two of us, the average age is 72. <laughs> okay, so things have changed. And I would say in these deeply polarizing times, 
when we're trying to find common ground where we can share things and do things together, even when we're not doing the same things, surfing versus swimming versus boogie boarding, it's really important that we learn how to share this earth. And Good Harbor Beach is one place we can do that on a smaller community scale rather than just saying somebody gets it and the other people do not. So I would appreciate your consideration and I think a trial project this summer is a great idea. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you got some pretty uh, pretty big shoes up here, bud. Let's let's yeah, see what I you got to say. I, I my name is Tori Rubolo. Um, I used to live at Six Rio Drive, which is right around the corner from Good Harbor. Um, I was a lifeguard for six and a half years and worked with a couple of people in the audience also. And we know that it's possible. I've been a surfer for almost a decade now, um, and I just think it's really important that we embrace the fact that Gloucester is a beach town. You can't, you can't go surfing at a tennis court. You can't build waves. You can't build these things. I mean, actually, nowadays, they, they kind of are trying, but um, you know, we have it, and it's free, and it can be safe. It's, um, the surf zone actually is one of the more dangerous uh, portions of the beach. It's right at the mouth by the river, and it can cause a rip current. We have a lot of people that s would struggle there anyway. Uh, we would end up blocking off that section of the water, um, which it would be hazardous conditions, and those hazardous conditions were actually very fun waves if you were experienced enough. Um, and, you know, I was really nervous. I don't, I don't know what else to, to really say, but I think that, um, I think there's a way that it can work, whether it's a flag system, whether it's a surf zone, a section, uh, just prolonged hours in the morning because the water really is cold in the springtime um, leading up to it uh, in the mornings and really you know potentially it could be uh, weekdays extended in the mornings and then weekends you know it's going to be busy of course so maybe weekends are could be off the table in the the midst of the summer but of course we have more rounded out proposals there's, I just think there's a lot of ways to go about it and there's a lot of uh, room for improvement on the, the system that we have right now. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, sorry to put you on the spot, but, um, you know. <laughs> How do you think I feel? I've been up here for three hours. Uh, name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Susan O'Leary. I live at 32 Magnolia Avenue. Um, Weather is not really good surf at Magnolia Beach. Um, I have three daughters. Uh, probably, let's see, four years ago, I decided to surf or try surfing, and I surf very poorly. And I apologize to anybody that I've gotten in the way of, which is probably every one of you, and they've all been so kind. Um, but with my three daughters, who are now um, 19, 21, and 23, if you think back to when they were four, five, and six, would be great to teach them how to surf. I would only be able to do that if I woke them up about 6.30, 7 a.m., loaded them in the car, got to the beach at eight-ish, had one hour in the water until nine, and then maybe we'd get out of the water and then supper time, little kids, trying to get them bathed and all that, it realistically start at five again to surf, I would, they'd be mushed by then. So as, as a mom thinking of when they were younger, to uh, expose them to this wonderful sport, something that they need very little equipment to do, um, you, you want to raise healthy, physically educated children, um, extending the hours and making it easier for the younger children to embrace this sport, I think would be a great idea. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Name and address, please. Uh, my name is Jacob Martz. Uh, I grew up in Manchester, but I currently live in Boston. Um, I've been surfing for about eight years in Gloucester now. Um, and I don't need to reiterate what everyone else has said about the community. This is a great group of people. Uh, what I'd like to speak to is um, 
you know, the links we go to as surfers um, to access good waves. Uh, now that I'm living in Boston, it's, you know, a long drive for me to get here tonight after work. You know, it took me about an hour and 15 minutes just to come up here and sit because I support the surfers union and everyone else who's here. Um, but when it comes to the summer months and there's limited access at Good Harbor, uh, I'm unable to, to come to Good Harbor. So a lot of times, um, like others have mentioned, I have to go all the way to New Hampshire or all the way down to Rhode Island, sometimes even out to Nantucket uh, or the Vineyard. Um, and I, I think it would be really great for the city and for the area and for the surfers and the non-surfers um, to get more, more people involved with the community, um, as well as making it easier for people like me to come home and bring my friends to say like, hey, this is where I'm from. It's a beautiful place with beautiful people and here's a fun thing we can do. Um, and we as surfers are willing to do that. A lot of times we drive out in blizzards in the middle of the winter. You know, some folks are saying they were surfing this morning. Um, we have the passion and that's why we're all here. Um, and we've gone through such great lengths to put together this well thought out proposal. Um, and so we appreciate your consideration and hope you're, you're really hearing uh, how much we all care. Thanks. Thank you. Um, one second. So how many other people would like to speak? All right. One, two, maybe. Okay. I'll keep it brief. Yeah. Come Tyler on. No, 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 no worries. I was just wondering, um, just, just curiosity. Name and address, please. Uh, Tyler Knizel, 14 Eagle, Eagle Head Road in Manchester. Ken Eisel. K-N-E-I-S-E-L. Would anyone like my phone number? <laughs> um, I was, I was just, everyone, I full, fully support everything everybody's set up here. I was trying to think of a way I could be additive. Um, and again, I have three children, six and under. Some of the greatest first memories I have as a father is pushing them into waves at Good Harbor. Um, but it struck me, speaking to you to try and convince you of our personal passion may not be the only thing you're interested in. Um, when I was a bit younger, uh, we invested and built a house in Rincon in Puerto Rico. And as you know, Puerto Rico got devastated by Hurricane Maria. And what I tell you is from a town, Rincon was one of the first to recover. Um, and I largely attribute that to the resiliency provided by the surf community. Uh, surfers are incredibly tenacious um, and they, they want this unique resource. And when you look at Good Harbor Beach, what you may see is just a beach, but when you look at that little river mouth area, what you're actually looking at is probably the equivalent of a small ski hill uh, or something of, of, of that uh, effect. And as an economic driver for this community, is something that is, instills passion in people to drive up from Boston from all over to come here. It really actually is, a for someone who's been fortunate enough to have surfed all over the world, it's an incredible wave. Uh, and it's something that people will not stop coming here for. Um, so I couldn't implore you enough to open it up. I'd love to be able to push my kids into waves between the hours of nine and five in the summer. Um, but I really do think it's something that's very special that you, we may all take for granted. Um, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak in favor? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, all right, anybody else in favor? Come on up to the microphone. Name and address, please. Aaron Thomas, 10 Loma Drive, Gloucester. So we've hired a lot of really nice heartfelt stories tonight, and I could sit here and bore you hour for hours with these. Not that theirs were boring, mine might be, but uh, I'm a banker, so I'm gonna talk about the economic impact of it. So my wife and I, Jessica, we happened to move here about five years ago really exclusively to surf. It's uh, somewhere we can surf, we can go to work, and we can come home and be where we love. And in the summer, we have a lot of friends who would love to come up here and surf, but at the end of the day, we have to go to Rhode Island, we have to go to the Cape, we have to go to Hampton, and we're spending hundreds of dollars there. And when you look at that over the summer, we've added it up, and I'm happy to send you folks the numbers. We're talking close to half a million dollars, sometimes millions, depending on how the weather is and how many people we'd get up here in the summer. 
So while we've all got a lot of great reasons, I want you to look at the economic benefit that it could provide the town as well. And uh, I would love to discuss that further with any of you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor? All right, seeing none, is there anybody that would like to speak in opposition? Step up to the microphone, name and address for the record, please. Uh, John O'Hara, 9 Butler Ave, Manchester, Mass. Uh, first, I'd like to say, this isn't really an opposition, so I don't want to use that terminology. Uh, this is just some concerns some of us have that are basically uh, focused around safety. Uh, I'd like to footnote also uh, my residence. Uh, so like I said, I currently reside at 9 Butler Ave, Manchester. However, I am, have been a lifelong resident of Cape Ann and also um, born and raised in Gloucester, educated through the Gloucester school system, graduated from GHS 81, city employee, parks and rec 77 to 81, commercial fisherman, lobsterman, peer worker, et cetera. Uh, in addition, uh, tax paying property owner from 96 to 219. So, uh, sure. Um, so anyways, um, I'd like to acknowledge Cape and Surf Surface Union for the work. Uh, I think they brought up some great points, um, great people, and um, not trying to be a buzzkill tonight at all. Uh, we're actually, we're gonna speak about some other parts of surfing, which are the safety issues, and there are some serious ones, very serious ones. Um, and also what I'd like to say, I hope we can, we can all work to come up with a situation that works with both surfers and families alike. <clears throat> if there is a number one concern of ours, it is making sure kids and families, whether Gloucester residents or visitors, can enjoy a relaxing, stressful, and safe day at the beach for two months out of the year. <clears throat> All families have this right. Uh, before I get into pre presentation, I'd like to share some sentiments from our group uh, of concerned surfers. Um, give me a second here. Um, they are, so, I think this is some of the concerns. I think the, the reward is small compared to the risk of losing surfing altogether at Gloucester. We have Good Harbor Beach virtually to ourselves from May, uh, from September through May. Good Harbor Beach is primarily a family beach serving a large community and a democracy family wins. One accident or confrontation, we could lose surfing at Good Harbor Beach forever. Uh, the reality is that most people, the current summer surf hours 9 to 5, really to 9.30 to 5, on most days align with work hours. Uh, and I imagine the Bass Rocks folks uh, would not be too pleased with the parking issues. Um, final, final. Uh, what is the win-win here? What is the benefit to Good Harbor Beach and the families that go to the beach into the greater community? Uh, so those are some of the outside concerns. And before I get into presentation, uh, I'd like to share some sentiments. I'm sorry. From pro, uh, I'd like to share some of my, my own personal uh, experience here. Uh, I've been surfing Good Harbor Beach um, since 1986 when I moved back from California. Uh, in addition, the past 10 years, um, I spent working in the surf and paddleboard industry as a um, employee, uh, ambassador, and competitor, uh, and that was both nationally and internationally. Uh, in addition to uh, spending 34 of those years also doing some pretty s extensive surf travel around the world. Um, so I, I do have a good amount of experience in the water. Um, after moving back, uh, our surf population then was, was probably plus or minus 20. We all knew each other and we all surfed relatively peacefully together with safety and etiquette. Today, as the Surfers Union said, they have over 200 members. The surf community is even larger with many beginners and novices who may or may not understand surf safety and or etiquette for the good of all in the water. This growing surf community has seen some issues from safety of boards, a lack of knowledge and to at worst aggressive behavior in the lineup. None are positive or add to safety. Uh, tonight my hopes are to share some of the knowledge and realities of surfing 
and display and demonstrate some of the items we use when surfing. So the city and the city council can understand our concerns for the well-beings of surfers, swimmers, kids, families, and lifeguards as well. Uh, first, I'd like to show some of the boards. I brought several, but I think we're only going to use one. This is a traditional long board. It's uh, 10 foot long, uh, weighs about 23 pounds. That's a very traditional board. The long boards, which is most of the boards surfed at Good Harbor Beach, are 9 to 10 foot. They will weigh anywhere from 15 to some of the old ones up to 40 pounds. Add a fin to that, add a leash to that. Uh, Dave, would you mind putting that on the ground and just extending the leash? Uh, each board has a leash with it. Generally, the leash is the length of the board. So this leash is a 10-foot leash. So that makes the board and the leash 20 feet, fully extended and, f with, and, uh, and fully extended with, with some uh, taut on the leash and stretched. You're looking at a 22-foot circumference. So all surfers are responsible for that area around them. Uh, so, needless to say, um, that's a lot of space with 50 to 100, 100 surfers in the water all at once. Some on long boards, some on paddle boards, which are even larger and heavier. Uh, last summer I counted over 96 surfers on one summer night in addition to 23 in surf schools on the inside. Uh, have some information here about the here at the city. Uh, I'll give a copy to the um, woman over here and also um, some copies that you guys can uh, pass around. Okay. So the lead, lead presenter for the in favor gets 15 and the same thing happens with the uh, lead presenter for um, I'm not going to call it opposition, but just Okay, great. Right. So I'm going to show you here what I was going to show you. It's a picture of the Good Harbor Beach surf break. There's an outside break, and there's two inside breaks with the learners, and the lessons are inside. You can see the directions where everyone surfs, going in all various directions. Okay, on top of that, this is what I'm going to get to next, is, uh, is a graph of surfing injuries. 67% of all surfing injuries are caused from boards. Um, and so, I'm going to get into some of that details. Um, so this is coming from Inertia, it's a surf website. Most common injuries are lacerations, facial fractures, joint, uh, facial fractures, joint dislocations. Never underestimate the force of two 180-pound people on boards moving at about 20 miles an hour colliding with each other. Joint dislocations are likely to occur in this, in this situation. Uh, on to the next one from surftheory.com, surfertheory.com. Surfboards are amazing objects and designs, which they are. However, they all can be dangerous weapons uh, that hit most sensitive parts of the body, causing lethal and reversible damage to the human body. We've all been in the water. We've all had some light to heavy injuries over the course of our surfing time. Uh, and it, it can get pretty real out there pretty fast when something happens. Uh, and it might sound, then this is, to me, this is a bit overkill, the statement, but I really want everyone to hear this. It might sound strange, but the only difference between guns and surfboards is that a firearm are made purposely to hurt or kill. Surfboards were designed to provide, excuse me, did I cat call you guys? Yeah, let's be respectful, please. Let's be respectful. Okay, surfboards are designed to provide moments of joy, which they do, but they can also harm and hurt and have serious consequences. Like I said, that's a bit overkill, but I, I wanted to say that. Unfortunately, surfboards have killed people, and surfers, and swimmers. They are missiles driven at high speeds when, and when they hit. This is why surfers carry, and I want to emphasize this, surfers carry an enormous responsibility under their feet. An enormous responsibility under their feet. And there are many situations which beginners, intermediate, advanced, surfers lose their boards. We've all lost our boards. We've all had our leash broken. We've all been out there when, no offense, some hipster guys and girls come out with no leash and they think it's cool. It's not cool. Happened to me last year, mountain biking, uh, fractured my wrist, went out to surf, here's a board coming at me, put it up to protect me, fractured it again. I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I never lose my board. I said, really? You just lost it. Okay, and that, that's happening, unfortunately, more and more frequently, people surfing without a leash. 
Uh, everything in a surfboard is dangerous. If you're not convinced, let's take a look. Um, depending on the board, the nose, the tail, account for 21% of all injuries. The deck and the bottom. Uh, large surfaces are traditionally hit the surface in the head when they wipe out, resurface, or kick in an offshore wind condition. The rails, Dave, show them the rails. 21% of all surfboard injuries, light and hard blows cause bruises, concussions, break bones, and teeth. The fin, 40% 40, 40 of all surfboard related injuries called by, caused by surf fins. That surf fin can really do some damage. That's basically a knife going at a hard speed. And most of them are smooth, not all of them are. Uh, and also the leash. Dave's holding the leash. Okay, that leash, Jack, Jack O'Neill, the uh, wetsuit pioneer, founder of O'Neill, lost an eye after an outstretched leash slingshot back and hit his face. Never underestimate what a leash can do in a case of a wipeout. Okay, lastly is from a uh, San Diego injury and accident lawyer blog. The real danger of beachgoers in action sports is the proliferation of water sports such as surfing and paddle boarding. People who are poorly trained or worse yet have faulty or poorly designed equipment are suffering severe injuries in the water. And it goes on to talk about paddle boarding has grown quickly and I've been part of it. And the popular with past few years and it too leads to a surprising number of, of incidents. And I'll leave with this as kind of the last note on this, this information. Uh, beach is a crowd, everyone proceeds with caution, look out for each another until a surfer is behaving in a reckless manner and collides with you. As a result, this, this you may have a case against him. This is legal stuff by lawyers, okay? Uh, and the life-saving equipment does not work properly. The people need rescue, suffer injuries. When the lifeguards can't prevent all accidents, they are protect and respond in emergency. Failure to do so may consider light and negligent. This is some of the stuff the city of Gloucester has to look at in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in addition to uh, some people using the beach, whether they have a business or not, for their own private surf schools, uh, adding to more people and more uh, accidents in the water. And certainly, uh, you know, more tension out there. Um, so, I'll finish with this. Um, so needless to say, there's a lot of things to be, uh, think about before, for the city and the city council to be concerned about as well before making any decisions at Good Harbor Beach for the safety and enjoyment, surfers, swimmers, kids, and families that are all that all love Good Harbor Beach and have the right to use it and enjoy it peacefully and safely. In closing, again, I'd like to acknowledge the Surf Union. I am not opposed to their uh, their work and their efforts, um, and I'd like to present our proposal which is extending the surfing hour, very similar to theirs. Mine was gonna be until the kids get out of school in Gloucester, which is basically about June 21st, I'm guessing. Um, and extending the surf day until 10 in the morning. Uh, and that gives us plenty of time. We can surf from sunup until sundown, and that gives everyone at the beach seven hours. Um, and that goes through Labor Day. Uh, and if you really do the calculations, we're basically we're basically losing about 490 hours of surf as opposed to, gain, as opposed to we have 8,320 the rest of the year. Um, that's all I have to say, and I uh, appreciate your listening. Thank you. And I think there's, there's some other people that would like to share some of their experiences. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to speak in opposition, please? Yes. Come on up. Name and address for the microphone. My name is David Pascarelli. I live at 7 Richards Road in Beverly. I've been a surfer in Gloucester for 30 years, probably longer than maybe more than five or six people here. Just be um, a big joy. Probably longer than maybe five or six people here. I've been surfing in Gloucester for 30 years. I grew up in Gloucester. Uh, my dad sat in one of those chairs for three terms, so familiar with city government, and I have a deep-rooted interest in the town. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about safety and my own personal experiences of talking about safety. Most people here have been injured in small or large ways. In 30 years, I've been hit with four boards. Two of my own, two of someone else's. My, one of mine, 12 stitches in the face, another one of mine, 12 stitches in the head, 
one of someone else's, three stitches in my groin, and another one from someone else, 12 staples in my head, I was knocked out in the water. Yeah, I was rescued from drowning by another surfer, but I was almost killed by one too. So I had to get 12 staples in my head, I lost 12 hours of memory, I still haven't got that back, a major concussion. I tell you this because surfing is an inherently selfish endeavor. We're all selfish in our surf. My wife calls herself a surf widow. She's been with me for 18 years. Um, I'd also like to point out that the, the economic benefits that people are pointing to can be easily wiped out with one accident and a lawsuit. In 2010, a local surfer, who I won't name because he has now moved to Florida, we were out on a small day at Long Beach. During the day, the guards were letting people surf. A handful of us moved down the beach. This individual decided to surf right in front of some families. A gentleman was body surfing with his two kids. This, this surfer hit him, broke a vertebrae in his neck. That individual sued the town and sued the surfer. I couldn't find the settlement results because, as you probably know, it's almost impossible to find settlement results when a town settles. You can ask people in Rockport. I'm sure you all know other selectmen over there. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say that, well, not lastly, but second to lastly, I'd like to say that they're quoting um, surf beaches up north. Um, most of those are barrier beaches that are miles long. We have pocket beaches here. Good Harbor Beach is 1.1 miles long, maybe 1.4. Hampton Beach, the south beach, the main beach by the boardwalk, is 1.1 miles long. That's the beach that all the families go to. They do not allow surfing there for good reason. The only other point I'd like to say is I, don't, I think the idea of expanding surfing by a couple of weeks in the spring makes sense. I think the idea of going till 10 a.m. makes sense. But to be honest, if they were being honest and fair, which most of them are, um, the guards already let us surf till 10 a.m. and let us back in by 4, 4.30. And on rain days, they already use their own discretion. So what you're doing is you're now putting the onus on the guards to make these decisions formally, and you're putting that city at liability. Now it becomes the guards' job to go out and rescue surfers when they have a problem that shouldn't be out there anyway. Right now, yes, the guard is still going to go rescue them, but the city's not at liability if they're not supposed to be out there. Lastly, I have a nine-year-old daughter. She's learning to surf. She goes to one of the aforementioned surf camps. I have no problem with the surf camps. I think they do a great thing. My daughter uses a soft board with rubber fins because she's a kid, and that's the smart thing to do. I think if you do want to push forward a proposal, and some of their ideas I think merit uh, discussion and make sense, I think the idea of um, limiting it to soft surfboards, which are now quite good, not like in the past, with rubber fins, all of which are readily available in the marketplace for less than hard surfboards that we all surf. I think that's a, a common sense proposal. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dave. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, are there any communications? You received all the communications. We had 19 communications in support. Thank you. Uh, are there any councillor questions? Councillor Peck. It's not so much as a question as just a little education. Um, over 60 years ago, as I grew up and lived on Beach Road and grew up on Good Harbor Beach, and my two older brothers uh, were both surfers. Uh, I did the pizza board thing, but uh, um, uh, my oldest brother still has, over at our home at uh, uh, Good Harbor, still has his, what I guess today you'd call your long board, um, but his original Hobie surfboard that he used over six, 60 years ago, it's still over at our house at Beach Road. Probably worth a fortune. I still wish I had my Vision Gator back in the day, my, my skateboard, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Councillor Gilman. Um, surfers, I'd love to hear um, a little summary about your conversation with Mike Hale, because he was part of a conversation, I, my understanding, with um, Councillor Memhard. And um, just a couple of thoughts about what he had to say, because he's not here tonight and um, DPW um, oversees the, the beach rules and I'd uh, love to hear just 
your comments. Do you need my address again? Courtney Hayes, 1057 Washington Street. Um, myself and Christine Manning and Christian Del Rosario met with Mike Hale and Ward Councilor Scott Memhard a few weeks ago. It was really, a, for us, it was a listening session. We were just really there to hear their concerns mostly. Um, you know, I think, you know, of course, everyone wants to be safe and um, there's also concerns about crowding, overcrowding. Um, and so I think the consensus feeling is that, um, you know, we want to do something that's definitely safe and reduces crowding. And um, we, we actually feel that um, expanding access in some of the ways that have been suggested could re reduce crowding because right now there's a swarm of people that typically show up at 5 p.m. And it's quite frankly not terribly safe. So we kind of, I think, um, you know, I think Mike Hale felt what we were proposing was very sensible because it really does spread out utilization and we're really ultimately asking for a little bit of additional access at times when the beach is underutilized and my sense from his response was that was very sensible and in some ways I really feel like it's legitimate to argue that it could make um, the way surfing occurs at the beach safer. Um, you know, I know there's some people that are worried about, you know, sharing the waves with new people and overcrowding, but quite frankly, I think a lot of us feel like by adding a little bit more time in the morning and a shoulder season and opening up the opportunity for surfing on days when it's bad weather and there's just really very few people in the water, that that will spread out the impact on those warm days where right now there's just too many people in the water because that's really our only option. And, um, you know, my sense from, that's kind of what we talked about. Um, my sense from Mike Hale was that he felt that that was sensible and, and wanted to work with us on how to make that happen and um, without overwhelming the, um, the lifeguards. But he, I got the sense that he felt like a flag system could be a really efficient, clear way of achieving that. Is there any, anything else, Christian or Christine? Council Gilman. Yeah, I just want to just make a general comment. Um, I'm, I'm proud that I'm Courtney's um, ward counselor, and um, I just think you all have done a wonderful job presenting your case. You were organized. You're excited. Um, you showed us best practices. You knew our ordinances. Um, you had a conversation, a collaborative conversation with the ward counselor and with Mike Hale. So um, I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure the rest of the council feels the same, that um, I just, a 10-year-old here tonight not doing his homework, like talking about how much he loves, how cool is that? So I just wanted to thank all of you um, for, your, um, for your spirit and your love for sport. Um, and that's all I had to say, thank you. Councillor Councillor Holmgren. Uh, echoing Councillor Gilman, uh, my deep appreciation uh, for you all being here and being so thorough uh, in your presentation. I would be comfortable supporting this, uh, probably with a sunset clause, uh, just in case. But um, uh, you've given us very compelling reasons to support this endeavor, and I do appreciate it, having been in your shoes. Um, just a few years ago for a different matter. So, thank you. Anybody else? Council Memhard. I would like to echo the other councillors' comments and thank everyone who has spoken in, in all senses. Uh, we do have a wonderful, unique resource here, and you're talking about utilizing it more fully and bringing some enjoyment uh, to all of us. You did let me down a little bit because I was really hoping you were going to give us a video tour of the vicarious experience of what it's like to be out there on a board in those waves, but we'll just have to uh, settle for watching you from the beach or from Nautilus Road. Yeah, uh, my sense from our meeting and talking with Mike Hale that, that, that we're going to look to work with his department, work with the uh, chief lifeguards, and have them work with you to draft some uh, proposed um, temporary or, or 
trial ordinance or regulation that would address some of the reasonable measures that you've requested. It will always be held at the discretion and under the control of the lifeguards and the responsibilities that they have to, to save life and not to be distracted. Uh, but Mike certainly also as a former uh, surfer himself with his family felt that these were some, there was gonna be some reasonable compromises here that we could move forward with to give you better access and better utilization of, of our waves. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, is there anybody else? Uh, Councillor Cox. Um, I do support opening it up. Um, I do support a, sun cl a sunset clause as well, just to, so we can circle back and review the data um, from any changes. But I do believe, since this is a regulation, that this will not be back before us mm -hmm. if there is a change. Um, so I do wish you good luck, um, and I hope that um, Councillor Memhard carries this through for you as the ward councillor. Um, so I look forward to it. Um, is there anybody else that would like to speak? Um, so I'd just like to say a couple of things. Your energy is infectious. We appreciate you guys being here this evening. Um, public hearings aren't always fun, uh, as you saw this earlier this evening. So it was nice to hear uh, not only the people in favor, but the opposition. We do hear you. Um, if you go to the City of Gloucester website, up in the left-hand corner, it'll say government. If you click on that, it'll drop down and it'll give your counselor information. All of us are on there, our telephone numbers, our email address. Um, so what I recommend is reaching out to us to see what we can do to help you or maybe find a compromise. Um, we just did it with the, the dogs off leash a few years ago. Um, you know, I'm not promising anything. Mike Hale is basically the, uh, the person that'll go through. We don't have any action for us tonight. But I do appreciate you. We all appreciate you being here tonight and being be very thorough. And uh, it was I, I it was fun. I enjoyed it, and I'm sure I, I speak for everybody up here. So you guys did a great job this evening, and we well, applaud you. Thank you. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy what we do up here. It's not a not an easy task, and. We do good for everybody. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. I'm going to close the public hearing. <clears throat> yeah. Could I? Could I? Could I get everybody's attention, please? We've, we've, got a, we've got a couple more matters to do this evening. So if, um, if we could just, yeah. Just uh, a couple of things, everybody. We've, we've got a couple of items left we have to finish up. So if you can just uh, exit uh, very politely, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, next order of um, business, please. Next order of business is the decision to adopt Special City Council Permit 2019-008, Fuller Street, number 35, map 168, lot 14. Gloucester Zoning Ordinance, section 1.8.3, standard to be applied, section 2.3.17, conversion to or new multifamily or apartment building, four to six dwelling units, section 3.2.2A, minimum lot area per square dwelling unit in section 3.2.2 a minimum open space per dwelling square foot to increase the number of residential condominium units from two three bedroom units to four two bedroom units and two one bedroom units for a total of six units in the nbr 20 district councillor gilman before I move this to adopt, I'd just like to recognize that Mark Nestor has stayed here patiently for this one little event. And um, thank you for your patience. We appreciate it. Um, so at, at this point, I would just like to move to adopt. It's been moved and seconded. Councilor Gilman. So 
I would just like to say that um, for, I thought our council on this particular matter did a, an awesome job with um, our discussion, our deliberation, and being very, very thorough. You know, not only do we have multiple public hearings or, or just a, a lot of conversation with the neighbors, um, I'm just really proud of every one of us for really doing a stand-up job. Um, so I'm very comfortable with um, moving to adopt this. So thanks for the second, and um, thank you. All right, so we have a uh, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Roll call, sorry. <laughs> Councilor no um, Nolan is absent, okay. Councilor O'Hara. Councilor Pat. Yes. Councilor Cox. Yes. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Hogram. Yes. Councilor LeBlanc. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Memherd. Yes. And Councilor no uh, Council Nolan, I'm sorry, he's absent. So we have the motion to adopt the decision for 35 Fuller Street. Seven in favor, one opposed, and one absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, next order of business is the individual council's uh, update. Oh, update on the uh, State Road Park Advisory. Councilor McCarthy. Well, Mike Hale was happy to uh, fill me in a little bit on stage for today. He said with no snow, he's been able to keep crews up there um, through the winter. And if you've been up there and you notice along the, uh, the Lucy walkway, um, the trees are cut, they're cleared. There's a nice view from the old orchard area up there now. They're replacing the wraparound deck on the visitor center, which is well underway. Um, Mike told me that he's working with the street hockey people that came uh, before the for CPA funds recently. Um, he doesn't think that they have enough money. He sees that as maybe a year away, but he's, I think, traveling to Weymouth um, this week to look at some um, lesser expensive ways of doing the court, and he thought he may be able to help them and have them up and running by next year. David Dow uh, is reporting that the cannon restoration is on track. He's hoping they'll be uh, ready to display somewhere, not at Stage Fort, but somewhere by the 4th of July this year, uh, including the one that will be able to fire a salute. They have an engineering company that's completed a conceptual plan for Stage Fort Park that's um, a new entranceway from the visitor center to the cannons. It's going to be handicapped accessible um, and also on the uh, lower walkway which is on the Lucy Davis walkway um, which is a, a large undertaking and a costly undertaking if they can identify the funds they'd like to uh, bring the, have something before us within six months um, they'd like to have all the work constructed before the 400th anniversary um, the Generous Gardeners, I don't know if you've seen it, they've put in a new potting shed uh, down next to the tennis courts. They, uh, this is going to make their work a lot easier. They can keep all the material there instead of working out of the backs of their cars. Um, and that's about it for stage four. All righty, good job. Um, next, we have the uh, Madam Clerk. Can we do the next order of business, please? Councilor's request to the mayor. So, Councilor McCarthy, seeing that you are you're hot on the mic, we'll start with you. I have none. Thank you. Councilor O'Hara. Councilor Memhard. Just like to thank everyone for their consideration of the uh, surfers, and I think that that's an opportunity for us, and I, we need, need to be careful about it. But I think Mike Hale was certainly willing to. Uh, uh, follow through based on their presentation to us and that we're all on the same page on that. So thank you. Councillor Cox. Um, I'm going to ask that we schedule a Board of Health presentation regarding the coronavirus. Um, the CDC released some recommendations today in regards to a possible uh, pandemic and um, I'd like to get some educational information 
out to the public as soon as possible in regards to like a definition of a pandemic, um, asking for a presentation, asking, um, you know, what the Board of Health plans to do about this. There is already a extreme shortage of N95 masks, um, even in the city. Um, we use them in construction. So I have been having a hard time finding them just for construction work because people are starting to go ahead and gravitate and get those. Um, so I'm requesting through you and a request to the mayor to have a presentation in a timely manner to us regarding that. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, CDC is also recommending not having large gatherings. Um, I, I know it's a little early for that. Yeah, I know. They are also um, making some recommendations of um, no international travel. I just booked two trips to Europe. Um, so. Uh, I, th I think it's important that we get in front of this and, and try to share as much information about about this uh, virus, um, but we have to also be careful to not cause a panic like the swine flu, which resulted in um, very little loss of life, but the World Health Organization did list that as a pandemic possibility and it caused a lot of problems. So. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cox, and uh, I agree. So if we can get some uh, a request through the mayor to schedule a public hearing or a public presentation. Pu presentation from the Board of Health um, sooner than later, that'd be fine. We'll put it on an agenda, yeah. Okay, Councilor Gilman. Three quick things. Councilor Nolan has a Ward 5 um, board meeting at six o'clock on Thursday night at the Magnolia Library. I believe the police chief is gonna be there. Number two, the clerk's office has gone above and beyond getting prepared for early voting and then doing all this massive work. So thank you. <laughs> and number three, we have a very important birthday tonight, today. Um, so um, John McCarthy, um, can we do a quick song? Ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who wants to sing? I'll sing. Okay, Let's go. go. Ahead, ready? Let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. John. Happy birthday, birthday to you. All right. Happy, Happy birthday, bud. We appreciate you. Uh, Councillor Pat. Yes, happy birthday, John. <laughs> Council Holmgren. Happy birthday, Thank you. Uh. Yes, happy birthday. Um, I have nothing also. I uh, want to thank everybody. Well, uh, very good job this evening. It's tough what we do up here, and um, appreciate what everybody does every day. So thank you. And thank you. For thank you. And uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, thank everyone. You,